Okay, welcome everybody to another uh, little Sunday session. We are about uh, one month into the year now and uh, pretty good um, movement in WTI kind of as we had last year. There's a seasonal slowdown that happens in, in December, a lot of moving parts and uh, January as well. It kind of moves into that with some, some rebalancing going on. And then also a low demand point for petroleum and petroleum products is, is sort of this time we are heading into the shoulder season, refinery maintenance season for some of the US based refiners here. So uh, yeah, so so should be kind of a nice little uh, bump here and on our way to hopefully very similar performance as we had last year for at least the first six, six and a bit uh, months of the year were really fantastic, uh, euphoric, if you will. So today's presentation um, is our quarterly macro outlook. As I was mentioning before I started recording here, it's going to be more of an update as opposed to the full macro outlook. Uh, although I love doing the, the full presentations every three months, I think it's just getting a bit too repetitive. So uh, I'll leave the, uh, the October 30th presentation as the kind of the main one to reference. And then this is an update on top of that uh, just just bringing the data up three three months uh, on on some of the major supply demand inventory points, and then a U.S. shale update. And as I mentioned, it's less insight focused. It's more that 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 we know the data around shale as a whole. We know the data around well productivity. We know the data around what's happening on the supply chain side of things, the inflation side of things, and I just want to show visually through maps and through graphs that, uh, you know, what's what's happening at the 50,000 foot view is also backed up by what's happening on a company by company or a county by county view. So it's going to be just a, a overall uh, deeper dive to make sure we're not missing anything. You know, uh, sometimes what can happen is a basin as a whole can be declining or growing slowly, but there's certain companies that have a lot of open acreage that have not really developed it and can really ramp up. And, and we don't want that happening to us in shale. We've uh, had shale affect our oil and gas investments for uh, almost a decade now at this point. So no reason to get caught off guard, especially with the level of data that's that's out there these days. So few things up front here. I am not an investment advisor. So please uh, do your own due diligence on kind of what I'm saying today. Everything that I share today, I will also reference certain websites. Some are free, some are paid. But if you want to do your own, own own due diligence, your own research, this is mostly publicly available information. There is stuff that I pull from other reports and whatnot that, that may not be available. But either way, I think uh, most of it's out there. Please check your risk tolerance. Oil and gas is a very, very volatile sector to begin with. It's always been that way. And now with the changes in the overall macro, uh, how volatile it's gotten with the changes in the way people trade and they buy options and margin and whatnot, there's even more volatility. Uh, that's, that's a part of it. And please check your portfolio construction. The way that I run my portfolio off this uh, is going to be completely different than the way that somebody else may choose to have a look at it. My portfolio is fully public on the uh, White Tundra homepage, whitetundra.ca. Once again, for anybody, on Twitter spaces that would like to join for the Zoom visuals, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events and the Zoom link should be there. This video, the Zoom is recorded. It will be on YouTube and then under the archive seminars, hopefully by kind of later today, depending on how long we go and uh, how long the processing takes uh, for the video. As well, the Twitter space is also recorded uh, for, for the audio only uh, sort of portion of things. I do have a mailing list where I send out the Zoom links and latest any latest uh, invites. So if if somebody would like to join that, uh, please either Twitter DM me or email me, and we can get uh, get you on there. As I mentioned last week, I'm still working through some of the holiday backlog, and uh, it's 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 taken a, a little bit of time. So uh, we're just gonna get through that. Uh, I apologize if you had emailed me or DM'd me and I haven't got to putting your name on the mailing list, but but I will get that on there. And uh, 
Yeah, other than that, I think the website is updated. My portfolio was updated there uh, last week, January 25th. So I know it was a couple couple months there, but I was on restriction on a certain equity. That's now off. So I was able to update that uh, that portfolio and uh, long delayed, but I'm also working on, on a couple of Seeking Alpha articles now. Uh, it's been about a year since I released the last one. So I think it was a good time to get back into the swing of things with, with all writing. Uh, portion of it, along with the the uh, Twitter posts and all that, that are just going to continue. And uh, yeah, I don't think I had too much else up front. For anybody that's new attending, I will say, um, I mean, you're welcome to listen live for sure. And then I would go back and reference the October 30th presentation as well, which gives you a more deeper dive into the more so the supply and the demand portion of it. I talk about inventories a lot. Uh, in today's seminar as well. For anybody that uh, is in the future viewing this on YouTube and you have a chance and you want to spend the time looking into oil and gas macro, I would suggest you go back and watch the October 30th presentation first and then use this as kind of an update on that and a more deeper dive into shale, which I think is going to be a major, major um uh, what do you call it, like a like a polarizing factor going forward, where certain people believe that shale can ramp up to ungodly amounts of production. And then there's other data that's suggesting that not only can they not grow, but there's a significant problem here from a supply demand perspective, a raw barrels perspective, but also from a psychological perspective. The amount of people out there that are failing to put a risk premium on the price of oil that are failing to put a geopolitical premium, that are failing to put an energy scarcity premium. A lot of that has to do with their view that if anything goes wrong in the oil market, shale is just going to ramp up another million barrels per day next year. So as long as people continue with that mindset and not realizing what's happening under the hood, there's, there, there's going to be this natural lack of participation and people actually, in fact, might be shorting stuff uh, as soon as oil gets to 80, $85, they feel like, oh, this thing is completely overvalued. The, they still think she'll break evens are 20, 30, $40. So I'll get into all that uh, here as I go on. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where we are. So we'll get started. I apologize for anybody that's new joining. I cannot take questions on Twitter spaces. So just the way with the audio recording, how it is, uh, you will have to come onto the Zoom for any questions. And yeah, we'll we'll end with a Q&A session as well, depending on uh, where we are on the time once again uh, going forward. So yeah, so we got our topics. Um, so we'll start up, start as as usual with the USA pricing. This is one day delayed, but you know, still still pretty good. We were able to get over that eighty dollar mark uh, for for about a week or so. Friday knocked it down again. A lot of paper activity, uh, pretty significant hit that uh, the oil markets took, not the equities, but the but the oil price itself, which is which is very interesting. The way there's this certain days, there's this huge divergence. And we're seeing more and more of them where oil prices goes down and the equities don't do too, too bad. Uh, and even if oil prices go down for a few days in a row, it seems like there's a point where the equities just stop dropping uh, because the people in them just realize, hey, you know, this this is kind of on the on a supply demand uh, versus oil price comparison, it's getting to points where it shouldn't. And it also is allowing new buyers to come in who are looking for that little bit of a dip. So a really good price action to see. I'm not gonna read too much into it because it's, it's still very uh, kind of inconclusive day to day, week to week. But the point I wanna make here, if you just look in the past five years, you know we're, we're still looking pretty good other than a three to five month period last year where we were above these prices, still pretty good. Uh, and I'll remind you from 2015 to 2020, WTI averaged $50 a barrel. So at 81, for people who have been in this trade for call it a little bit longer, uh, this is great. You know, this is great. I'm not happy at $80 a barrel for sure, but you know, right now things are good. We can still see where, where the macro is headed. We can still see where global supply demand is headed. It's an inevitability almost. Uh, there was a comment made on Twitter on one of my posts that uh, uh, the fate is sealed for energy markets, uh, which I quite agree with. 
as people who are following me uh, kind of know already, uh, really. Um, we also have the fiber Henry Hub chart, where quite quite a you know the the word collapse actually may be properly used here. Uh, it's being misused for a lot of other things on the financial world, but I really think uh, this 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 fits the definition here. Uh, but hey, look at where we were pre-COVID. We were in this two and a half three dollar range um, where 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 Henry Hub stayed. U.S. shale producers are are just notoriously uh, not caring up to a point, and we're reaching that point where not only are the producers itself suffering from such high inflation that that they maybe don't want to drill these wells uh, at these sorts of pricing, but also a a sort of X factor is that if the U.S. producers drop rigs, the oil producers will happily take them and lock them up for. 6, 12, 18, 24 month contracts. So about 150 rigs in the gassy basins, uh, if you will, that that may make their way towards the Permian, towards the Eagle Ford, and even towards some of the other, other sort of fringe basins uh, in the US, because there could be a few sweet spots uh, left in these, which are quite attractive at today's pricing. So uh, watching for that, the US natural gas market is, very finicky, up and down. It depends on LNG as well now. It depends on Canadian imports. Uh, one thing I will say is just watch the Permian gas production. The associated gas production is just rocketing up. There is uh, gas oil ratios keep rising. And then the new wells are being drilled in, call it, not the core of the core. So they already begin with the higher gas oil ratio to begin with. So uh, uh, the Permian is now at 18, 19 BCF per day. Like a oil basin is producing 19% of U.S. natural gas supply. And then you add the Eagleford and the Bakken and the other oily acreages on top of that. And uh, U.S. oil production makes up a significant part of U.S. gas production. Strange. But, but that's the way we're headed. That's the way uh, shale works. That's what's going to happen more and more. So... You know, do do we really want to look too much into Henry Hub? I'm not sure. There's a lot of weather effect, obviously, to it. It just kind of can can stay where it is. Um, we would like to see it a little bit higher, but also low natural gas price has other benefits for, uh, for example, heavy sour barrels, which are more costly to refine. Um, they get a benefit if ACO price is down, um, as well as. Uh, sorry, ACO, Henry Hub, and global natural gas prices. So there's there's other benefits short term. Look at the chart on on Henry Hub, how it goes up and down. There's no point really getting too crazy one way or another uh, based on where we are right now. This could be double the price in four weeks. So we'll just watch. Uh, on the Canadian side, looking pretty decent. Uh, what's happening here? So uh, looking pretty good on the Canadian side as well. The Canadian condensate. You know, trading above WTI again where we wanted it to. Uh, there was a lull period there where it went below WTI. Uh, looking pretty good here, about eighty-five dollars a barrel. This was as of Thursday close, so call it two and a half dollars below this right now. Uh, definitely want to see strength in the lighter barrels as well within Canada. A lot of the producers that I invest in uh, or speak about are exposed to this. Call it condensate light oil blend. Uh, uh, pricing mechanism, so one to watch. The other one is heavy oil rebounding. It's looking good. The differential has narrowed. It is expected to narrow further. Uh, I will remind viewers, this is not an egress differential. This is a sour barrel differential. So there's a glut of heavy sour, uh, medium sour that got put onto the market because of the USSPR, because of the fact that OPEC's last barrels, when they completely unwound the cuts, are going to be their heaviest, sourest barrels. It's just the way things work. So uh, now that those two factors are kind of off the market, uh, temporarily at least, and also we're, we're seeing natural gas coming down, as I've mentioned, a little bit better for desulfurization capacity. Uh, Chinese refineries have kicked on. The Kuwait's Alzur uh, did have reportedly a problem last week uh, where it was down, but 600-something but thousand barrels per day, looking pretty good. I believe Exxon's Blade project should be really like ramping up at this point. So few 
nice things happening with, with refining uh, heavy oil itself looking good. Uh, I'd like to see this referential uh, WCS Hardesty to uh, Cushing WTI, uh, call it narrow to, to about a sub $20 range, call it high teens in the next month, month or two, uh, hopefully. And then, and then we'll kind of see how that plays out depending on how many Canadian barrels are out there as well. So uh, we'll see how the maintenance season is uh, on the oil sands players, not expecting anything super, super uh, major this year, uh, but we'll see, we'll see how it all, all sort of plays out along with the, the overall production, you know, production of the oil sands looking, looking really good. Um, okay. So how do I track the paper crew trading? That's through the CFTC commitment of traders data. There's also Morgan Stanley puts out an oil manual report every three weeks or so, which tracks trader positioning, uh, depending on what kind of trader they are. And then other like momentum based uh, analysis that they, do, that they do on crude itself. Um, I will also tell people, I think Goldman has some really good information as to why the paper markets today are lower uh, in terms of uh, a total positioning than it was over the last few years. So has to do with interest rates, has to do with value at risk modeling uh, as well. Um, yes, yeah, so yes, lots of Canadians. Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate everybody's support and and my focus is is mostly Canada. So I think it just makes sense. Um, so, so what's going on with WCS? We just said it's around, call it 55 to $58 a barrel US. That's where it's hanging out. If we look at a 10 year chart, you know, a little bit on the lower end. We're not we're not to the highs where we were in 2014, 2013, uh, where we were in this $80 high in US uh, WCS. But there's a kicker. The Canadian dollar now is about $1.35 as opposed to being on par back then. So what's happened is $80 US WCS back then, Western Canadian Select Heavy Oil, uh, was about $80 Canadian a barrel back then. Now, $55 US uh, WCS is about 75, roughly $73, $75 Canadian uh, WCS. So we're trading relatively close to where we were back then. And this is what WTI in the low 80s. So as we see that market uh, just get better here as the cycle goes on, nothing is going to happen overnight. Nothing is going to happen over a month cycle. This is a long extended cycle. These are businesses that are built over a longer period of time, not over a six month period. I don't think any bulls should be victory lapping yet, uh, quite yet. I don't think any bears should be victory lapping quite yet. Uh, this is a very nice cycle. The bulls have obviously made way more money uh, throughout this cycle. Like it's, it, it's not even close. It's a different planet uh, based on who's made more money, the bulls or the bears through this oil cycle. But where we are right now is at a pretty pivotal point. Uh, you know, both both parties seem to have a very high conviction uh, case that they're making, and um, I'm presenting my case accordingly, uh, as I have in the past as well. So, a uh, little bit on equal gas. I I do want to mention this because this th this chart is pretty interesting. Uh, where where you see what ha what's happened, the spot price has dropped. The next year, eighteen months has dropped a lot. Uh, in terms of eco gas pricing futures. That's just to do with the warmer weather and where we are in overall supply demand, um, especially with the US natural gas production and Canadian natural gas production. But here's the interesting part. If you look into 2025 and onwards, the curve hasn't really dropped. The From a month ago, the curve hasn't dropped. It's still looking relatively strong that far out. So one winter doesn't change the trajectory of natural gas for the entire decade. It's a one year, maybe 18 month kind of impact. And that impact can be reversed quite quickly if things move the other way. So if, if call it 30 gas rigs move into oil acreages in the US, that could have a material impact on shale production next year, uh, US gas production and US oil production uh, for that matter, more so gas than, than oil, just given the decline rates. Uh, on these gas producers are are relatively high, uh, and more production is more more shaley focused, uh, if you will. the The second point on this curve is that if we compare it to a year ago, not only is our is our strip looking higher on this front month, 
But despite the problems in the front, front month over the last month or so, the back end is looking really good. So compared to kind of last year, 2024 is up about 10, 15%. 2025 winter is up about 20%. Uh, going even further, 2026 is up another 30, 30-ish percent. So a little bit of optimism on LNG Canada coming online, obviously. But just overall, the market is realizing these short-term impacts are short-term. The overall supply-demand issue is longer term. And if you have lower, lower pricing in the short term, you can't fix the long term. People were not willing to invest at $100 oil and six, seven, eight dollars gas. What do you think they're doing at $80 oil, $3 gas, right? The, the lower the short term pricing, the higher the back end should start to get, or at least get way more stabilized. I don't think we're going to, into any sort of contango mechanism uh, for longer periods of time, but you can see why why that's happening uh, in a sense, even though there's there's opposing theories on what backwardation means and what contango means. Um, you know, you can you can argue it both ways, I guess. Let me put it that way. Uh, but it is it is nice to see that 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 even when the front month drops, the back end stays you know quite strong. So something to note. Uh, Euro European gas pricing as well. We're seeing okay, it's down what. 80, 90% since um, June, July, August of 2022. But hey, it's still up 125% from where it was 18 months ago. So just, just put things in perspective. European gas already trades expensive compared to North America. And now it's up even more. That, that arbitrage uh, dollar amount per MMBTU is even higher. So I think overall, we're not in a bad place. Would I like to see this firm up a bit? Sure. Uh, definitely, it helps our gas to oil switching theory as well, uh, which maybe didn't, didn't really come through this year to the extent we thought, just given the two standard deviation warm winter that Europe had. And the fact, look what they did here. They panicked and they paid incredible amounts of money just to refill storage when it could have been easier. Not saying this is a possibility, it could have been easier to maybe take a little bit of risk on the natural gas inventory side and pile up fuel oil and diesel and accumulate that when it was a bit cheaper in, call it August, September, October, hindsight's 2020. No, no political government is going to take that risk. Uh, but, you know, sometimes economics uh, and, and not doing what the herd is doing in a particular country can end up really changing your, your economic uh, burden due to high energy prices uh, throughout the cycle. And yes, yeah, yeah, poor Vermilion, exactly. Here's your chart uh, as to why what's happened with Vermilion, you know, is true. Um, here's, here's winter 23. So looking a bit further out, we see the same kind of chart where big, big up uh, uptick and then a drawdown. But we're still, if we compare to where we were in June, July, August, 2021, you know, in this case, we're up 200% uh, probably here. And then we look even further out, as we saw with ACO, we're seeing that the further outstrip pricings are not dropping as much. Now, there's not that much liquidity in these, so, you know, they're not gospel per se, but they still give you an idea of how far out the curve are people pricing in this short-term, uh, call it hot uh, winter. So it's, it's actually firmed up. If you compare these two charts, you can see what I'm trying to say here is that the closer we are, the further it's fallen, the further out we are, um, the less it's fallen. So, you know, looking pretty good here. And again, natural gas can change in four weeks. In four weeks, you could be talking a completely different story where the narrative again has like changed to this energy crisis narrative uh, as well. Um, okay, so we'll get into inventories here before I do. A quick reminder, anybody on the Twitter spaces that would like to join for the Zoom session, uh, whitetundra.ca. If you scroll to the bottom under events, uh, you can uh, join us. If not, feel free to keep listening in uh, as long as the Twitter space. Hopefully, there's no, no issues here. Um, okay. Observable global crude oil inventories. Here's your chart. We are about... 3% below last year. 
we are about 100 million barrels below last year. We have about 3.7 billion barrels of onshore crude oil inventories, okay? So anybody who's gonna go out and start uh, spreading fear about, we got this huge, massive uh, glut in China, we got this huge uh, storage somewhere secret, it's not there. So when we look at things on an overall basis, it's not there. And I will also talk about the chart, including SPR and all that here as I go as well. So this is just a, the one chart, uh, which I think we should keep in mind. Uh, pretty pretty steady drawdown here, even in 2022. Yellow is our 2022 line, looking pretty good. Uh, keep in mind, that is with US production still up last year. You know, Not a million barrels a day, but still up. This is with Canadian production up last year. This is with OPEC unwinding their cuts. Remember, OPEC unwound their cuts in the first half of last year. This is with Libyan production looking really good. This is with Russian production having never dropped off. And we're still sitting 100 million barrels of crude less than we were this time last year. You know, maybe it's important to take things into context rather than just throwing out random information um, about China and uh, the data is fake and all this stuff. You know, the data has proven to be quite quite good so far. Um, so, so yeah, just watching this here as we go on, nothing really conclusive here. Uh, I will say for those who are new to the oil and gas space, when we say there's 3.7 billion barrels of crude in inventory, that doesn't mean it's usable inventory. That includes oil at the bottoms of tanks that you can't grab. It includes oil within pipelines, which you can't get to. It includes SPRs, uh, which, which aren't just gonna be released just because um, other than the case of what we saw last year, uh, which was obviously politically motivated, um, you know, which nothing can be done. It just is what it is. We have to take those things into, into our modeling. But we also have to realize the US SPR sits about 200 plus million barrels below where it was last year. So it's not just a infinite reloading SPR. There's a, there's a specific volume in it um, that can be used. So, so I guess to, to get back to my point, it it would be like you saying, okay, you know, there's there's certain things you have in your house, um, like you know, it's COVID during COVID time. Toilet paper is a really good example. You know, you had X amount of rolls, but your some of them are in use, so you can't call them inventory. But if somebody comes and asks you how many toilet paper rolls you have in your house, you kind of have to count them. So, so that's what the oil market is, even though there's 3.7 billion barrels in storage, maybe less than half of that is actually excess inventory. And keep in mind, prices don't rise when you absolutely are at zero excess inventory. Prices start rising when you get closer and closer to that zero level of excess inventory and people start to panic and they say, oh my God, I need extra, you know, I need a little bit of safety net here. I can't, I can't be running my economies this way. We know what happens when consumers run out of oil and gasoline and food. Things go haywire very fast. No government that's making lots of money doing their nice little jobs are going to want that. So they'll rather have a little bit of extra crude oil storage as opposed to run things um, right at the, uh, at the panic level. A little bit more on products. So global products, we look at distillates, um, very low. Distillates is at a multi-decade low is what we're starting off at uh, right now this year. Why? Because diesel fuel is what runs the economy. So when everything stopped during the COVID time, uh, people stopped consuming gasoline, jet fuel, et cetera. People still started, uh, people were continually consuming diesel for the products that were shipped for their uh, agriculture, for refining, you know, whatever else, home heating, et cetera. It just kept being used and we don't have it. We just don't have enough diesel right now. It is a going to be a pretty interesting problem here going forward. The crack spread for diesel is much higher than it is for gasoline. It has been like that for the last 12 months plus and likely gonna continue for the foreseeable future. I don't see any fix to this right now. Not good for oil investors because we want a higher oil price and a less crack spread. Uh, but but right now, we just don't have the diesel refining capacity to produce these barrels. Alzur will help. A little bit of 
uh, out of China will help, but there is a large gap in the market um, so far. I'll just jump to jet fuel here. You, you see what's happened with jet fuel. <laughs> We're again, just fallen off a cliff here and, and don't have the inventories. And keep in mind, international jet fuel travel is just picking up. I will talk about this in a few slides, uh, but, but jet fuel travel uh, or jet fuel consumption could be a million and a half barrels per day more in six months. Not exaggeration. This is based off forward-looking schedules. This is based off announcements by airlines that have been approved by federal aviation regulators. This is not just mumbo jumbo. This is based off real news and um, what the earnings releases are being put out. Uh, so where's the problem? The problem is that jet fuel and diesel come out of the same refining stack. So if we need a million and a half more jet fuel, which is relatively low inventory, and it comes out of the diesel stack where diesel is al already low and we don't have the million and a half extra barrels of refining capacity, what's gonna happen? So the jury is still out. Is it gonna be that crude prices jack up? We need more heavy oil production to make up for those. There's some refineries that can, that can maybe increase their runs or does a diesel jet fuel a crack spread blow out again as we had last year, we had a little bit of a issue there. And the secondary problem here is that US refiners skipped maintenance last year. Some of them wanted to really take advantage of the high crack spreads, so they skipped maintenance last year. You can only do that for a year. This year, there's about double the number of spring maintenance activities going on. So there could be a period here where, depending on how fast demand kicks on, we'll see where we are entering March, April, May into high demand season. And if, if jet fuel and diesel inventories have not rebuilt, we're gonna be, we're gonna be watching to see what happens? Crack spreads could again bl blow out. Um, you know, we thought we had the problem solved, but at this point, there is a possibility uh, that we see that yet again, depending on once again how fast refiners can kick on. Gasoline, not too bad. I wouldn't say there's a glut by any means um, of refined product. It is kind of just just where we are here, about 500 plus uh, million barrels ish. And the five-year average is about 520 to 540. So looking pretty good. China is, is pumping out a lot more gasoline than it is diesel. So it is helping the market. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that gasoline is being consumed within China and then within the Southeast Asian market. So we haven't really got a chance to build gasoline inventories. LPGs, liquefied petroleum gases, you know, nothing really much to talk about here. It is where it is. It's a seasonal thing. We're gonna see uh, how far we draw here on this, especially with some of the emerging market demand coming in very strong uh, for these LPGs uh, here um, over the last little bit. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, thanks for attending. It's, it's great to see everybody uh, once again here. So I uh, do appreciate it. If you have any questions, please just put it in the chat. I will try and get to them, not not maybe right away, but um, you know, as as we kind of go on here. So here's your global petroleum inventories, crude, plus products, at sea, onshore, and in transit, and including SPR. I shared this graph uh, last week, I believe. This is your granddaddy of inventory data, and we are about. Two, one, two percent below where we were last year, which was already, you know, pretty tight inventory. You could say last year, and as I mentioned earlier, we've used up every source of supply, easy, low-hanging fruit supply that could have come online, has come online in 2022. Sure, there's going to be production growth from other places. Uh, there's also production declines in other places. So, you know, we we fired up the OPEC barrels, we fired up the Canadian conventional the US conventional, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, some of the other offshore platforms, Norway's Johan up 2 is now online. So any project that was kind of coming online is online. And uh, once again, this is with us having no major geopolitical issues. We didn't have any problems in Libya and we didn't have any problems in Russia. So those are big stars where something could ramp up and get uh, messed up in a really quick fashion. 
you all know what happened with Iran and, and Israel yesterday. So, you know, this is something we've taken for granted that oil oil geopolitical climate is, is relatively, you know, call it peaceful. Um, it's never peaceful, I don't think anyway, but but relatively peaceful. And where we are now, usually you see more conflicts when price of oil rise. When there's more money to be made, when there's more at stake, there's more conflict. So watching for that, I, I'm not praying for anything to happen by, by any means. I'm just telling you what could happen and us putting our blinders on and just saying all is well in the world. Life doesn't work that way. Investments don't work that way. So we have to be realistic on this. Um, and yeah, Damien makes a great point here that that airline prices may rise. The airline ticket prices may rise, uh, you know, stunting demand just a little bit, just given where we are on jet fuel and diesel. We'll see. I don't want to speculate right now. It's better to just wait for the data to come in and make kind of changes accordingly. But yeah, if jet fuel is short, if diesel is short, the crack spread will rise. A lot of airlines um, cost of their ticket is fuel. Um, especially when uh, fuel prices rise, so we do need to make you know that 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 uh, kind of uh, take it into your modeling accordingly. Uh, and for sure, you know Dirk mentions a great point that that some airlines have hedged really good. I believe Delta, uh, if I'm not mistaken, had had some really good hedges. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that that as as time goes on, we never fixed the the diesel jet fuel problem. It's still a problem. It's slowly getting into a worse problem, and we're not really fixing it. So we'll kind of watch and and see what happens. Um, okay, there's a question here on the portfolio. So I will make this pretty clear for for anybody that's new. The personal portfolio is my TFSA and my other registered accounts and a cash slash margin account that I keep. It is my personal funds of mine. The White Tundra portfolio contains money within a corporation, which is all my funds that I made personally. There's no friends and family funds in there. There's no investors in there. It's my funds. Because I used to run my engineering, consulting, and field operations through a corporation, the corporation ended up accumulating a whole bunch of dollars. And I ended up using those as, as long-term investments. Instead of pulling money out of that company, um, I just invested into long-term uh, equities in that, which of course, through 2020, 2021, 2022 have grown significantly. So it's not a fictitious portfolio. It's a real portfolio. It's all my money, but it's within a corporation, which is run a bit separately than how I run my own funds, which are which are a lot more aggressive with options. Um, and of course, my own portfolio has different tax uh, implications on short-term and option trading as opposed to a corporation that's doing these things. So um, they're both real portfolios. The White Tundra portfolio is about 15 to 20 X the size um, of my portfolio. I don't, I don't accept any outside investment at all. Um, I do appreciate your support, but, but it's just not something that I'm interested in doing. Um, and then, yeah, so, so yeah, my private placements are within the, the corporation, yes. Um, they're, they're not all, the private companies are not reflected within the uh, portfolio circle, uh, if you will. Um, yeah, for sure, no, thanks for asking. I think it's it's a question I get a lot. I've been trying to figure out how to like get that word out. I added little captions uh, on the on the homepage and I don't wanna clutter up uh, stuff either. So um, yeah, so hopefully this helps. Focusing more on the US. So I talked about uh, this here, focusing more on the US liquid stockpile, this is your 2022 graph right there. Drawing the entire year. The yellow is our 2021 graph. Drawing the whole year, we've come down from about 1.975 million barrels to about 1.6 million barrels in the last two years. 20% of the total liquid stockpile is gone. And let me rephrase now. If we say that about 500 million to 700 million barrels in the US is like our working stock with the example that I'd referenced earlier. We only had about 1.3 million of excess. Um, where am I here? 
And, uh, and now it's down to 900,000 barrels excess. So instead of us being down 20% in our actual, we're down 20% in our actual inventory, but our usable inventory is down 30 plus percent. So, you know, this is where some of these thinking about things from that perspective, you know, makes more sense than just looking at barrels uh, as, as one entity. Um, this is the same graph in a cumulative fashion. And you see what's happening. <laughs> it's a pretty significant slope here that isn't stopping, doesn't look to be stopping anytime soon. So we'll just watch. Uh, we'll see what happens, what levels we get to. Uh, just for the people who are on Twitter who can't see this, we're down to January of 2004 levels in our total liquid stockpile in the US. Uh, at the same time, demand has kept going up and supply situation is, is, is not that much better because the US used to produce a lot of conventional oil, um, even uh, as, as recently as the 2000s. Same graph here, uh, more, more, even a more historic data. You see, as we were consuming more, the total inventory was actually going up in this line. And now we're consuming about the same amount, but the inventory has gone down uh, significantly. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to look at this commitment of traders um, after the fact. Uh, Mark, we can maybe chat about it a bit more, um, but, but for the most part, um, we have less uh, commitment of trader um, volume, maybe not compared to like a month ago, but compared to two, three, four years ago, it's down significantly. And I'll talk about that um, kind of at the end of the presentation. Um, yeah, here's your crude storage. <laughs> so, an even sharper drawdown here. Uh, this is with SPR, obviously, most of the drawdown last year in crude happened in SPR. Uh, I've added a bit of this year's information. We are rebounding a bit, but look at look at the last five years and even the 2010 to 2014 average. This is a build time. The crude should be building at this time of year, all the way up till about March, April, we should see crude bills. Uh, we see yellow here is our 2021 drawdown. We saw 2022 never build. So, you know, healthy sign. Do I want to see this start to reverse in the next two, three, four weeks on the EI reports? Yes, for sure. Uh, the one thing that's going to work against me here is, as I mentioned, higher refining maintenance this year, February, March, is going to result in is going to result in less crude processing which might get US crude to build. So what's, what's gonna happen here? How are the refiners gonna work around this? Because we don't have the US uh, products to really sustain a slowdown in US refining. So is, is the US just gonna import more products and try and make up for it by exporting more oil, importing more products? How, how are they gonna work around this? Again, I'm not gonna speculate, we're going to watch the data as it goes on, but I'm just reminding you that when crude is building in the first four months of the year, especially at a time when U.S. refining is in a high maintenance season, it's it's normal. Crude is supposed to build, and then for the rest of the eight months of the year, it's going to draw. That's just the way it goes. So we'll see uh, how it plays out this year. I I think the number of refineries that go down is going to be a big factor. And how fast can those refineries that went down in the winter uh, storm here that they had a month ago and whatnot, how fast they, can they come back online and, and bring that refining number up uh, to where it needs to be, really? Um, you know, the, I'm not going to get into conspiracies, but, but if, there's, if there's one sector to look at that's actually price gouging, it's a refining sector. It's not the ENP producers by any means. Uh, SPR down, as I mentioned, 200 plus million barrels in 2022. They really took a lot of barrels out of this. We have about 372 million barrels in this right now. Um, keep in mind, not every barrel is extractable. And also there's a national security number of barrels that, that need to be uh, in the SPR. There's 26 million barrels that are gonna come back or that need to be released this year as part of federally mandated um, SPR sales. They have till September 30th. So don't be shocked if there's an SPR release that comes out. 26 million barrels is already approved 
and spoken for. So can they rescind that? Yeah, sure. They don't have to release them. But if they release 26 million barrels, don't get shocked and think, oh, here's another 200 million barrel release coming. It's not coming. Trust me. You're not going to have that, especially with the, with the way the House and the Senate are now divided. Um, it's just not impossible to release that. We don't have the inventories to begin with. Um, one counter factor is that I think about 15 million barrels of exchange barrels have to come back to the SPR. That is still 2024, uh, but, but the U.S. government is trying to get those barrels in earlier. So you might see the SPR go up a bit, about 20, uh, 15 million barrels, you know, not, not huge material balance, but that is 15 million that's coming out of the U.S. crude market, um, call it, and, and back into storage. So factor to watch for um, around the SPR. There's a lot of misinformation being thrown around uh, about how releases can happen. Um, you know, I will tell you, if there's a excess release that needs to happen, it needs to be approved first within the uh, political, call it structure. They need to put out bids uh, where ENP companies, refiners will bid on these barrels. And then those barrels are like two months delayed. So if anybody is expecting or is claiming that suddenly tomorrow, uh, 7 million barrels will start leaving the SPR per week, nonsense. It cannot happen. It, it literally is impossible uh, for something like that to happen other than those federally mandated sales, uh, which I'm not sure how the, how the bidding on those works. But as far as extra sales, um, it's, not, it's not an instant process. There's a, there's a uh, bureaucracy and red tape uh, that, goes, that goes through that process. Um, uh, yeah. So here's the same SPR graph over a 20 year period. You see, we are well below the 20 year period. Uh, people can argue all they want about is the SPR useful? Is it not useful? You know, do we need it? Do we not need it? Make your own conclusions. What I can tell you is 220 million barrels are gone. They're not coming back, you know, right now, anyways. So they're gone. Your safety net in the market is out. That's what we need to think about from an oil and gas investment perspective. If they refill it, great. But I don't foresee them refilling it anywhere close to the 700 million barrels they had um, anytime soon. And in fact, they might stabilize at this range of 350 million barrels uh, because that's where the federally mandated sales, we're going to get them down to, um, call it five years down the road anyway. So uh, yeah, so it's a pretty interesting times. Uh, here's the same graph on a 40 year period. And we and you see we're at 1983, 1984 levels in, in what's in the SPR. Um, being the world's biggest consumer of petroleum products, I would rather have more safety nets than less, but you know what? The SPR has done its job fabulously. It really controlled oil prices in 2022 and gave the consumers a break. It allowed supply to kind of catch up, but supply never caught up because this cycle is not a drill baby drill cycle. This cycle is not a higher prices, cure higher prices cycle. This is a geologic engineering step change um, cycle that's going to happen. It's an emerging market growth cycle uh, on top of that. So there's a lot of other factors uh, that that are not strictly just pricing um, and 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 uh, and supply response, uh, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you you can say the barrels were waste were wasted because I don't think there was a real emergency. Um, but you know what? People can can make their own interpretations on that because you, you can't argue that they did did control the market from getting overheated. I think I think if they hadn't released the SPR and let's say one or two other factors happened, like let's say China reopened a bit early or Russian barrels did drop off, the crude market would have gotten so overheated that it, it just would have gotten comical as to where WTI price was go going, where gasoline would have gone. Um, I had kind of this side bet um, with with a certain individual or like party, let's say, that uh, gasoline in the U.S., in California specifically, could hit $10 a gallon. It didn't get there, which is great. I didn't want it to get there. But 
if they hadn't released the SPR and some major catastrophic thing happened in Russia, you would have seen $10 per, per gallon gasoline. Don't, don't kid yourself. Um, it would have happened. And, and that's where I think some of the um, you know, victory lapping that people were taking that you should have sold in June, you should have, you should have done this, should have done that. You know, what did you sell in June, right? Like, like, let's see your portfolio and your trades and exactly what you did. Um, because I can, I can argue most people who are victory lapping, not only did they not sell in June um, if they held positions, but also they never held through the large part of the first half of last year and the big gains anyway. So, you know, if you're not in the game, why are you talking? Uh, is the way that I, you know, I like to think about these things. Um, on top of that, so another factor is in the last 10 years, as I was mentioning earlier, crude includes not just crude inventory, but line fill, it includes storage tanks, it includes export tanks, all inventory. And in the last decade, in the last 10 years, line fill has gone up by 50 million barrels. So 50 million barrels is in pipelines that you can't really use. It's not, it's not real inventory. If you empty the pipeline, the pipeline becomes unusable. So uh, it doesn't really make sense, right? So when I'm comparing crude where we are today to 2000, to 08, to 2014, just keep in mind, we have another 50 million you have to take out because it's effectively unusable oil. On top of this, there's another 50 million that went into storage tanks and export tanks um, because the U.S. became a net exporter. There was a lot of, or sorry, not a net exporter. Because the U.S. actually started exporting oil, crude oil, you need export tanks of large size um, because ships might come in all at once. There might be a delay on when ships can come in. There might be a fog incident. There might be rough waters. You need a lot of excess storage that is effectively unusable for the general market, but it's used just for the export market. Uh, so, so another 50 million barrels of that. Effectively, in the last decade, we're down about 100 million barrels of effective excess inventory that has to come out of any crude inventory calculation. So I'll just put that into context. Here's the crude storage with SPR. We're at right now about 825 million barrels. The 2010 to 2014 average, when prices were in the $80 to $100 range, was 1.025 million barrels. So we're about 200 million barrels already below that. And then another 100 million is unusable stuck inventory. You can see why I am so bullish on the inventory situation, um, despite the two or three months of bills we've had, irrelevant. As long as it's happening in a bill season, and as long as I see that refining runs are down, which more than um, kind of explain what's happening with, with the last two or three weeks of EIA reports um, and crude price just doesn't care. Crude price said, forget it. We, you know, we know this, we need this. Let's look into what's actually happening three, six, 12 months down the road. Product storage. So if we're down on crude, maybe we built product. Nope. Uh, product storage is down once again uh, from last year about almost seven to eight percent. Last year was already about ten percent below the the the, the previous five year average. So, yeah, not not a good situation to be going into what could be a very high U.S. demand season. Um, they've done the federal funds rates hikes. They've blasted recession into people's minds uh, for a year now. People are getting sick of it. There's a lot of pent up demand that still has to come back. Uh, There's a lot of demand last year that got pushed uh, just because people, you know, were, were, were caught off guard by this high pricing regime that happened um, all of a sudden. And just when prices stay, you know, higher, people get used to them a lot easier. And prices right now are, call it 30% below in terms of gasoline where they were last year, aggregate US gasoline price. So, Looking pretty good uh, from this standpoint. Gasoline right here, like I said, you know, about 20% or 10% below five-year averages. Um, we're gonna see what happens. Not not quite worrisome. I think we're still we're still good on gasoline so far. Um, this is your um, gasoline uh, consumption 
in terms of million gallons per day, you know, still a little bit lower, but you can see what's happened here. Last year, the year over year change in dollars spent on gasoline was extreme. Like, like it was, it went up, call it 30 to 40%. This year, minus 5%. So psychologically, when prices stay higher, people get used to higher pricing. They're sick of waiting. They just say, you know what, let's, let's get on with it. Let's live our lives. Um, you know, the recession may be coming, but I've been hearing this for 12 months is what they say. And, you know, whatever, let's go. Let's, as long as we have money, we'll spend money. Um, distillate inventories. Getting to worrisome levels. It was already worrisome last year. This year, we're another 10% below. Distillate doesn't have that much inventory to begin with. Only about 120 to 150 million barrels. So not huge. And um, yeah, jet fuel is not going to compete for this exact same uh, refining, call it stock. So yeah, expect diesel to, to, to remain strong. Expect diesel crack spreads to remain strong. Uh, here is your, call it, seven-year chart. And, and on, on, a, on, a, on jet fuel, you see we're low already. And at a time when intercontinental flights from the US are, are just ramping up, they are getting more to Europe, they're getting more to Australia, uh, through uh, Southeast Asia, Japan, and China. So uh, it is getting higher. And um, you, you, you always hate to see a graph where demand is going up on a product and inventories are going down consistently. That tells you there's a supply problem and you know, it's it's going to come to roost uh, sooner than later. I think we're in the cycle already, as people know, and the cycle just is going to get stronger uh, as time goes on here. Canadian inventories, a little bit higher with the Keystone outage uh, that we had, but we see that that hardesty is once again declining. So so we're now again drawing barrels. Um, Edmonton is a little bit higher, but again, you know, within our sort of COVID ranges, uh, nothing has gotten completely out of hand. Canada only has about 80 million barrels of max storage capacity. So, you know, nothing, nothing crazy going on here. And uh, we have about 30 to 35 million barrels right now in storage. And we'll see how this goes on. Um, we don't want Canadian crude piling up and becoming an egress issue where the differentials start ramping up again. Not seeing it quite yet. I am watching the crude by rail data to see where we are. If the crude by rail hits 250, 300,000 barrels, you got an impending problem that needs to be fixed. The one, of course, other side of the argument is that uh, TMX is scheduled to begin line fill in Q4. Whether it's gonna happen, I don't know, but if that happens, you've, you've effectively at that point solved a lot of problems, both from egress and from a heavy, sour, um, monopolized uh, sales point issue perspective. Um, yeah, <laughs> for sure. So here's ARA, uh, Antwerp, Rot Rotterdam, Amsterdam, uh, gas oil, low, jet fuel, relatively low, uh, gasoline, you know, a little bit higher, but it's only 12 million barrels. Not crazy. Uh, fuel oil, you know, within the, the, the norms. So uh, one point I would like to make here is that I saw a lot of people trying to tell me that uh, gasoline was was piling up in Europe, and sure, in terms of percentage, it's piling up. But in terms of raw barrels, it's nothing. It's it's a it's a very small storage point. Um, it's it's more of a transition point where where ships offload here, and then it 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 goes into Europe through these points. So, you know, the the absolute barrel amount is uh, it's totally minuscule. Uh, it's the same with the West Africa thing. And I'm kind of digressing here. But all these comments on Twitter that, oh, there's all this crude piling up in West Africa. It's a big problem. And you later find out it was like three or five million barrels extra in terms of absolute amounts um, that went unsold or, or piled up. So if you're looking at any bare case to oil or bull case for that matter, don't just look at like within a five-year range where we're at. Look at the absolute barrels. Is it actually a problem or are people taking a percentage deviation on a small part of the market and trying to exaggerate things uh, to 
promote their narrative or whatever they want to do. Um, and I'll more than happily call out people like this all day long. Um, there are definitely bad actors on there um, that have a specific narrative that they're pushing um, using data that has this exact trend that I mentioned um, uh, where, where the percentage deviation is high, but the absolute number is meaningless. Singapore inventories, you know, looking pretty good. Middle distillates, again, very low. Uh, residues, which is your 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 very heavy uh, barrel uh, products, you know, looking pretty good. And then our light distillates are going up a bit, um, which, you know, we'll watch and see what happens. Once again, it's only an extra two or three or five million barrels. It's it's not huge. Uh, why are light distillates rising in Singapore area? We'll see. Um, I do think that the the more of the problem in diesel is in jet fuel, middle distillates, and sort of the heavy middle distillates, not, not the super heavy stuff um, and not the super light stuff. Uh, th those are kind of in, in sync, if you will. Saudi inventories, one thing that people completely fail to mention is that Saudi has uh, reduced their inventory, crude oil inventory by 200 million barrels since 2015. So those are effectively an SPR that no longer exists. So, you know, we don't, we don't have excess Band-Aids sitting all over the world. The U.S. was likely the only one. I'll talk about China here uh, in the future, uh, in the future slides here. So rising slightly, you know, we'll watch this trend, see what happens. What's counteracting it? Saudi product inventories are going down. So as their crude inventories are going up a bit, you know, they're not refining a tiny bit more. Their product inventories are down. Uh, about 15 million barrels in the last um, you know, year or so. So they kind of counteract each other. When you add up Saudi crude plus Saudi product, it's been relatively flat for about two years now. No major changes. Uh, and keep in mind, even though OPEC cut 2 million barrels, quote unquote, uh, the people at the time were arguing, oh, it's really only 700,000. Oh, it's really only a million. You know, you're you're over uh, uh, overplaying the actual cut. Okay, agreed. Now the spare capacity is only 700,000 or a million. It's not 2 million. I don't want anybody coding that, uh, oh, there's a 2 million barrel of, of spare capacity. You know, let's use the, ex the actual number um, that's out there. And if OPEC decides we're gonna shift our baseline uh, production numbers, could the actual spare, ca uh, spare capacity number be higher? Yes, I do believe so, because I think the UAE uh, does have extra spare capacity that's not reflected in the baselines and the way quotas are calculated, but we're not there yet. We saw no changes in baseline. So we, we can't just run with a, uh, a, a model that the baseline is gonna be changed. We're gonna stick with it as is. OPEC has been very cohesive since March, well, not March, since about summer 2020, OPEC has been as cohesive as, as it ever been they realize what's happening on a supply perspective. They realize what's happening on a demand perspective and they want the best for oil markets. For them, high prices and spikes are not good for them. They want oil to remain in this, like call it supply demand um, range uh, going forward. And they're trying their very best to do it. It's not an easy thing to control. As you know, this is a $10 trillion market. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, so I'll talk about the Chinese SPR as well here, and and there's a couple of points uh, that I would like to discuss on that. So so just just hang on there for a sec. Um, Fujara inventories, a big port hub out of the UAE now, growing in relevance as a shipping um, terminal, if you will. You know, looking pretty good, as opposed to two years ago. No real inventory build. We are about twenty percent below where we were in September 2020, you know, mostly on the heavy side. You can see what my point was about the middle distillates. We're, we're definitely low on them. The light distillates are within range and the heavies are, you know, kind of within range as well. So nothing too crazy going on there. Singapore inventories, floating storage. You see again what I'm trying to say. The low sulfur fuel oil is down about 50%. And, and this is not barrels, this is million tons. So there, there is a bit of relevance here. 
Um, low sulfur fuel oil is low. Fuel oil mix is within range and the high sulfur fuel oil has piled up. So I will be discussing this more in detail as I go on, but when people talk about products, when we talk about crude, it's important to dive deeper and figure out which exact distillate is the problem. Which grade of marine fuel is the problem here? Which one do we have a glut of? Which one is within range? And which one is lower? Just saying that crude products are building, you know, your, your statements is meaningless. It doesn't, it, it doesn't give me any information as to what's actually going on, how to trade, uh, how to how to put it into my model, how it affects my investments. It, it doesn't mean anything. You really need to figure out actually what's happening. Uh, and Vortex does a great job at, at tracking these things um, on a on a week by week uh, sort of basis. So China, here's your Chinese inventories. We're at about 1.02 billion barrels right now, crude, including SPR. Um, Pre-COVID, we were, we were at about 990 million barrels. Does it sound like there's an excess somewhere? Um, in fact, since the high of COVID, we've dropped 80 million barrels. So I think the some of the Chinese data that's being shared, including about the SPR and its humongous size, um, is wrong. It's just flat out wrong. There is no indication whether satellite, whether using any state data, whether using any cavern and tank data that proves that the Chinese SPR is quote unquote two times the size of the US SPR. There is no indication that they've overstuffed and absolutely flooded their SPR. There's no data that proves it. If there's any data there is, I would love to see it because I've been asking for six months now and um, I haven't seen anything that proves uh, to that case. So China so far looking good. Here's the week by week change in, it, in inventory. Certain points were build up points, certain points were drawdown points. Looks like we're, we're at a drawdown phase here again. And why is that? Because China imported a ton of crude in October, November, December, and now January. So when inventories are going down, while the crude numbers are really high, what does that tell you about refining, right? They're finding a lot more crude. The products are being consumed internally or within the Southeast Asian market, which equals Southeast Asia and China are reopening massively. Their demand is going up substantially. Um, so, so looking good so far. Um, here's Japanese inventories. We're down about 20 million barrels in the last two months. So something has definitely changed here um, as far as what they're doing. Could be a little bit of fuel oil consumption as well. Um, you know, looking pretty low. Compared to pre-COVID, we're down about 10% plus. So there's no glut in Japan either. China. Let's talk a little bit more about China. Here is your inventory. Crude inventory plus condensate plus NGL uh, and other refinery feedstock. So, so not the NGL that comes out of the plants, but NGL feedstock. And then it, it includes SPR. <laughs> we are right where we were last year exactly where we were, 900 million barrels. About 400 to 450, 500 is commercial, another 400 is their SPR. The SPR is full, yes, it is 100% full. So let's talk about this psychologically a bit. China just built their SPRs. So if they're, if they're building SPR as a crude storage, they're naturally gonna be full. They're not using it like the US did, where, where it's been built for 40 years. Now it becomes this like usable mechanism. It it's just being built. It's just being getting the first batches of crude go into these. So it's full, about 400 million barrels against the US, which is a crude import, uh, a crude exporter, a massive crude producer. China imports about 10 million barrels a day right now, plus their own. Uh, other consumption of 5 million, which they feed from their internal production. So a country like that, that's so liable to trade routes, that's so liable to increasing demand internally, they're not going to release their SPR just for, for fun. They're not going to release it because they need re-election. This SPR is in there. It's locked. Those barrels have effectively 
become unusable. So when I talk about how much real crude inventory is there, you've taken 200 out of the US, which was usable inventory, and effectively over the last five or six years, you've locked in 400 within China that became unusable inventory. Would China release it if oil prices hit 100 plus, 120, 140? Yeah, they will. But we're not anywhere close to that. Like the, the panic that I see over the Chinese SPR because crude's at 85, 90 is just way too much. It's it's That's not going to happen. Like China might release 5 million barrels here and there to give to some refinery uh, in use of need. But but for the most part, those barrels are being accumulated for a national security perspective uh, and a national security reasoning. So, you know, I, I don't think they're going to release it. Uh, the max they're going to do is use their commercial stocks more, import more, refine more, and put out more refined products onto the market, which we need. Like, I don't get why this is a problem. We need more refining capacity. I just explained in the inventory situation why we're short on refining and why we need those Chinese refiners to ramp up and to export products. It's a good sign. It's a good sign. We need more refining uh, and them ramping up even more and exporting more products would be good for the global crack spread, um, kind of just putting the lid on it. And in the meanwhile, giving crude prices a more chance to run uh, even higher. Here's China's SPR system. You see the size of it. We know exactly where they are. And as opposed to US SPR, which is in caverns, meaning it's untraceable, um, these are surface tanks with floating lids. So the lid literally floats depending on the level of the tank. So we can track these in satellites in real time. We don't, we don't need to guess. Now, if you're gonna make an argument that China smuggled hundreds of millions of barrels into some cave system and they're storing them as excess, you know, be my guest. And if you're gonna run your modeling based on that, be my guest. I'm telling you the data does not support it. Um, and there's no way that they could have smuggled that volume of data or that volume of barrels off the market. Um, could there be five, seven, 10, 20 million sitting somewhere um, where we couldn't track it? Sure. Um, again, it's immaterial to a market that consumes 100 million barrels per day. Um, yeah, great point. So the American SPR is a commercial uh, participant. The Chinese SPR is, as its true meaning, a strategic petroleum reserve. Product inventories. So this is a graph that I think really should be, um, you know, people should ask for these graphs. Every time somebody says products are building, there's this huge glut of product. Okay, where is it? Let's see it. Light distillate, drawing when it should be building. Middle distillate, drawing when it should be flat. Heavy distillate, building in a roughly built season, you know, heavy Distillate only has a few uses uh, per se, so not bad. It's building as it has in the last five years. Other, like other products should be drawing and they're building substantially. Here is the build that the people keep referencing. And look at the product category. It's not even important enough to give it a name. It's other, it's your, NGLs, it's your propanes, it's butanes, ethanes, petrochemical feedstock, stuff that has no real use other than those specific uses. Can you blend some of it into a gasoline pool? Yes, and Asia does blend uh, some of these products, especially butanes, um, into their gasoline pool, but it's still a very low value, limited use product. And it's already baked in because the NGL and the propane and, and the butane and the ethane price are already severely depressed compared to the rest of the product market. So it's your low value, low use product building, your actual usable products, your distillates and your gasoline and your jet fuel are within range, almost below range and drying. So, Two, two sides to the story. We, we really got to dive deep into these things and figure these things out. 
because looking at it from a from a sky high view doesn't give you a true picture of what's happening. As long as this remains true, you, you're going to see crack spreads keep going up. You're going to see the propane and GL market keep getting depressed. That's just how it's going to work. And you already see it. Worldwide crack spreads are going up, whether it's the US, Middle East, Mediterranean, um, or, the, or, or even the Asian market. Uh, Singapore refining crack spreads keep going up because there's a real problem in the usable products uh, category. Floating inventories. Um, so this is a, a kind of an interesting chart um, as well. So here's our global, a global inventories in blue right now, floating. You know, within a very tight range. Nothing, no, nothing piling up by any means. Uh, here's the global inventories last year. So compared to this, you know, we're five, ten percent lower. Not material. It is what it is. But China, China right now floating inventories about fifteen million barrels. Six months ago, it was about 25 million barrels. 12 months ago, it was 50 million barrels. So 35 million barrels of Chinese floating storage has come off the market. They have brought it onshore. Um, it's now reflected in their commercial inventory or their SPR, or they've refined it and they've exported products from it. So in essence, when we look at Chinese crude storage, including floating, including SPR, we're down. We're down 5% compared to where we were about 12 or 14 months ago. So here's your China onshore uh, graph, about the same as last year. Here's the floating graph is down about, you know, if we, if we just zoom back into October a bit here, you know, we're down 25, 35 million barrels. China overall has less crude where it is, where it's sitting. So any argument that's going to tell me that Chinese crude is, you know, building and there's this glut, show me the data. Where Where is it building? I'm happy to see it. Again, it's been six months. Haven't seen anything. Global crude and constate, just to back it up, using Kepler data instead of Vortexa, it's showing the same. This this graph is a bit delayed, but you, you can see how during COVID we, we had an, an excess 100 million of floating storage. It's largely been drawn down. Uh, at this point, you know, if we go back to the Vortex graph, we're at, at about 80, 80 ish million barrels, 80 to 85. And that's roughly where we were pre COVID. So, you know, nothing, nothing really uh, all that interesting there. Oil on water. So, global crude oil on water, well within our trend range. Oil in transit. This is active oil on ships that's being moved here and there. Um, I don't know why people have such a big need to like look into these things because it's effectively oil that can't be used. So you're not just going to go, you know, land land your commercial airliner on some uh, marine VLCC and start filling up, right? It, it's not going to work that way. So so the oil is effectively unusable. Not seeing any big concern here. Um, the Russian barrels that are taking longer routes are going to result naturally in more oil in transit uh, compared to the previous five years or, or even before that, um, as well as just um, more, the more oil we consume, the more oil that ends up in transit, right? It's just, it's just, it's just the nature of, of, of where oil is being produced and where the refining uh, infrastructure is being built. Iranian onshore inventories uh, are down from about 110 million barrels to 97 million barrels in the last two years. So Iran as well is pumping out a lot of their floating storage. We don't, we don't have excess anywhere. Um, and I'll end the inventory section on that. Um, if there's any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, a quick reminder, anybody on the Twitter spaces that would like to join for the Zoom visuals, uh, whitetundra.ca, if you scroll to the bottom under events. Um, and I can also take any um, questions on Zoom as well, just given the way it records uh, versus Twitter spaces. Uh, okay, a quick note on natural gas. You know, inventories are still within our range that we were in. The problem, of course, is the future outlook on the weather, which, which doesn't look all that great. Um, and meanwhile, supply keeps going up of natural gas. So you know, 
not not reason to really panic yet, but um, the price has spoken for itself given where we are. Um, and once again, that can shift very fast back, um, you know, three, four, five week uh, um, time frame. Uh, okay, same thing for Western Canadian natural gas. We're, we're actually at our low on our five year range um, because Canada is, is sending a lot of gas to the US. So uh, it's just the way that things are. They are taking every extra molecule they can right now pushing the entire North American price down. And that's with Western Canadian production up another 10% from last year, which was already up about five to 7% from the year before. So despite all that, Western Canadian inventories are still at the five-year minimum. You know, not, not bad place to be, but I don't like this chart. I don't like the Western Canadian natural gas producers just jacking up production, flooding the market. Um, it's not a good sight to see. They're going to lose investor confidence for good. And um, I'm not talking about the Monty names. I'm talking more so about the pure play, uh, more, more heavily gas-weighted producers. You are going to lose investor confidence uh, because it's a very small group anyway of people that are in this space. Uh, so, you know, not that I'm giving anybody threats or anything. I'm just telling you uh, what I feel as an investor. I I hated dry gas, natural gas companies anyway. I even kept my monthly exposure relatively low and uh, have lowered it even further at this point. Um, just given the lack of um, discipline I see on the Canadian natural gas side, it's it's this kind of graph is all you need to see to spook away uh, the, the natural gas investor. So a few comments on where does it go? The EIA has been notoriously wrong on forecasting inventories. They were wrong in March of 21. They were wrong in September of 21. They just said it was going to stay uh, or it was going to randomly just start building after it had been drawing for so long. Never happened. Uh, same thing here, April 2022. They just moved the graph up. The, the, the estimation and forecasting is just, oh, we actually grew inventories last week or, or last month. Let's just adjust the slope of the line so that by the end of the year, we end up at this like some arbitrary point um, that that has no meaning, uh, really. So do not rely on the EIA at all. <laughs> there's there's certain things that are good. Um, the, the 914 reports are, are decently good. Uh, the weeklies on a four-week average are really good. As far as any sort of forecasting metric, I would not use the EIA at all. Uh, it's complete junk. It's absolute piss poor forecasting. Um, as you can see, the record speaks for itself over the last two years. Uh, the same thing now, even further out, we're looking at 2022 August. And uh, again, they, they just keep predicting the same thing, a random unexplained shift uh, in OECD inventories, like a complete U-turn and then flat lines to some arbitrary number. Wrong. November, November, they did the same thing. And they keep lowering their final arbitrary number slowly so that the final number gets low, lowered slowly. But because we drew so much inventory, the slope of the line just becomes more and more unbelievably false. Um, you know, and the other thing they did is when they forecast OECD inventories, they don't include SPR in there which was one of the biggest factors of last year's total inventory situation. So effectively meaningless. Global demand. So I don't wanna to talk too much about the factors I've covered earlier on demand and supply and all this. They will be in the October 30th macro outlook. I'm just going to rehash some major points uh, that I think are important for this year going forward. And then if you're looking for more detailed information and discussion and insight, uh, please check out the October 30th uh, Macro Outlook presentation. So history versus forecast. We know what the crude demand history was. The forecast is where things really get spicy. EIA is forecasting 1 million barrels per day growth in 2023. OPEC is forecasting 2.2 million barrels a day of growth in 2023. 
it's going to be more than 3 million barrels a day of growth in 2023. When you look at the jet fuel market, just as one portion of what is, and I'll talk about this more, and then you look at the global economy and where it is, watch for these forecasts to keep getting revised up, especially the EIA forecast, which is just absolute trash right here. Um, and then the OPEC one is already a bit aggressive because you don't want to over say what's going to happen. But I think the market is a lot tighter um, than, than what these forecasting will, sh will say. Forecasters hate to be wrong on the upside. They, they, they would rather always be conservative and adjust the mod model accordingly rather than just go out and, and give some realistic model and then some other factor happens um, and, and causes them to be wrong on that. Uh, so we'll see. The US, EI is forecasting 200,000 barrels a day of growth, OPEC 200,000 barrels per day of growth. You know, maybe light, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see how the US summer demand driving season kicks on. Uh, and then and then the US travelers, how many inbound international travels are uh, travelers are there to the US? That's going to be a big factor. Uh, keep in mind, the US is the only country left on earth that still has an incoming vaccine requirement. Is it enforced? Maybe, maybe not. But it's still federally regulated law that it's an incoming passenger vaccine requirement. One of the House members has brought on a bill. Uh, I believe that's that's trying to remove that, and I think the removal of that will bring in a lot of travelers from uh, Europe, from Asia, from Australia, who just maybe don't want to take a chance. You know, fly twenty hours and then you get stopped because of this. So, could be a big factor uh, for international traveler travelers into the U.S. And when they come to the U.S., what do they do? They drive ATVs. They take road trips. They go to Yosemite. Yellowstone, Tahoe, all the national parks, which are all driving parks. They take buses, consume a lot of diesel. They take Uber. So it does translate in, into the economy a lot more than maybe what people are, are thinking at quite this moment. Um, and then the, the rest is main, mainly China. I think EIA is saying 0.5 million barrels per day out of China. OPEC is saying the same thing. So where do they differentiate is in the emerging markets. OPEC or EIA is saying 700,000 barrels. OPEC is saying 1.4 million. You know, dif there's a difference there. I think China is light. Oh, the non-OECD might be correct on OPEC, uh, but the US and China are light. So we'll see how it plays out. I don't want to get super overconfident here, um, but I will make a call here that, that these are likely going to be adjusted up as time goes on. Um, especially as long as we don't see some sort of super spike here, um, which obviously changes things. Like uh, those sorts of models can't can't really be modeled. Uh, if oil if oil hits one fifty, where does demand go? We don't know. We're gonna find out uh, if it does get there. Uh, okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah. So the power gen is something interesting to watch for these eco producers for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the energy chaos, uh, I, mean, I mean, this is just the beginning. They haven't solved anything. They made the problem worse by affecting supply in the one year where, you know, it was like a pivotal point. Could you really get supply online? Could you force it to come online? Instead, they dropped the price 40 bucks and now supply has no chance. Uh, people are not investing the money at all now, uh, given the volatility as well. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the national parks being closed last year as well and having capacity limits made a huge impact for sure. Uh, I noticed it in, uh, in Yosemite where I was, uh, I went two times, yeah, two or three times. Uh, so, uh, definitely something to, to keep in mind, uh, for sure. Global flight demand. Commercial flights are looking really good. We're at our 2019 level already, and you know we'll see how this trend sustains. Total number of flights are already above 2019. We are well above 2022, looking to hit all-time highs uh, as we did last summer. You know, a lot of people don't know this. Commercial flights are still lower 
but the total number of flights, including cargo, uh, private jet travel, military activity, did hit an all-time high last summer. This year is likely to hit another all-time high uh, as time goes on here. You see what I meant about the seasonality, about oil demand? It's not just gasoline. Jet fuel is also relatively low in uh, January, February, March, and then it really kicks on uh, with Europe and Asia and the U.S. travel season, business season. The weather is warmer in the Northern Hemisphere. It's just good. Um, jet fuel consumption embedded in current flight schedules. This was January 4th, before China had made a lot of news as to how they're going to increase international travel. So take this graph with a grain of salt on the bear side. It's saying that from January 4th to July, global jet fuel consumption is going up 1.25 million barrels per day. It's already embedded in flight schedules, as in it's already been spoken for at the airports. The airlines have already made it into their flight schedules. They've already started selling tickets for these. This is not some estimate of what could happen. This is what's already out there. On top of that, once China announced that they're opening international travel as of January 8th, there were new news articles that started coming out about new routes, resumption of routes, and addition to routes. So I'll just read some out uh, here quickly. This is just over the last, call it two weeks or so. And the point I'm trying to make is that this January 4th line, you see how much it went up in just a week here based on Morgan Stanley? I bet you it's up even higher now. And that's where my estimate of 1.5 million barrels of jet fuel demand increase by July comes in. So here are the headlines. American Airlines plans 26 daily flights to London Heathrow this summer. That's a record. Its previous high was 23 daily. Nothing to do with China. Even the US to Europe flights are, are hitting all-time highs, much higher than they were before. First flight from China in almost three years lands in Bali. Great. Starting March 1st, the flights will surge back to pre-COVID levels to Beijing and, and Shanghai uh, with 10 and four weekly flights to Guangzhou and Chengdu as well. This is Emirates, I believe. Um, no, this is Ethiopian Airlines who announced this. So African travel. Air New Zealand increases flights to China, has seen capacity increase twice in the last month already, and now a third time increase. China Southern launches daily Guangzhou to Melbourne route. It started off at once per week, just two or three weeks ago, and they're already raising it to 10 flights a week on the 1st of February. The pace of change is going to catch people off guard. If you're not paying attention to the headlines around international jet fuel travel, you're going to get caught off guard. So a lot of things happening here all at once from January to like mid-March, there are thousands of international flight routes that are resuming and restarting and new ones as well because of China reopening and the overall global impact that that has. Uh, another few headlines, uh, China Southern scheduled six international uh, route launches. Uh, launches. Um, their Zoom uh, routes as well, uh, China Southern to Hong Kong, which will operate three times a week. They've opened uh, routes to the Maldives. And the new Beijing Daxing Airport is now open to international travel again uh, as well. So something new there. And then Emirates, by the middle of this year, Emirates will have restored Sydney and Melbourne flights to pre-pandemic levels. Okay. When China reopens, Australia reopens, there's a direct link between how much activity there is in China and how much activity there is in Australia and New Zealand, and Japan, and Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, and then some impact on Europe and the US as well. So this is not a China reopening. This is a Southeast Asia and Australia reopening. And the impact of that is yet to be seen. Um, anybody who wants to count that out and say it's a non, like a non-impact, it's a, it's a no a problem thing, feel free to have your view um, and I will 
you know, happily disagree and invest accordingly. Uh, here's what I talk about in terms of embedded schedules. So we see uh, in domestic seats, we're going to hit all-time highs uh, as early as kind of two, two, three weeks from now. And uh, the, the 2023 schedule looks like it's ramping up even higher. Um, looking more than two or three months out is a bit kind of inaccurate because not everything has been confirmed, but you can see where the trend is going here. Same with international flights. We're, we're a little bit below 2019 still, and we're making up the gap and coming in strong. And I expect to see this line keep going up as things go, go on. Uh, for anybody that would like to track this, this is free. OAG right there, OAG Insights. They report this, I think, on a weekly basis, free. And um, I think international jet fuel travel is going to be the factor to watch uh, this year and track. There's a definite impact and a correlation to global uh, oil and gas consumption and to the global health of the economy uh, based on international jet fuel travel. As well, you can make some conclusions on the, call it uh, financials of the consumer as well, because people wouldn't be traveling if they didn't have jobs and if they were really struggling uh, with credit card bills and such. Chinese flight demand, some were saying that the increase were because of the, the Lunar New Year celebrations. No, it was a general Chinese reopening. In fact, there was a slowdown during the, the Lunar New Year, as it is every year. You know, look at look at this purple line, look at this blue line. 2020 is kind of, I mean, that's when COVID happened anyway, so, so you can't read much into that, but it's happened every year. And look at look at the curve as we came out of Lunar New Year. Um, I can say this confidently, in the next month or so, you will see all-time highs hit on Chinese domestic travel and likely going much higher. Uh, at the same time, international travel remains at about one-tenth to one-fifth of pre-pandemic levels. It's coming back. We already see it. The news headlines have said so. The people are booking flights that's, that show that. Uh, and the news articles are showing that the Chinese airlines themselves are saying, we're going to start this flight on this date. We're going to start this flight on this date. Chinese airlines are state-owned. They know they're going to ramp up before, um, before they do these sorts of activities. So look at the one thing that stayed constant during the Chinese COVID lockdowns. They never restarted their international jet fuel uh, uh, international travel airline capacity. Now it's coming back. It's coming back very fast. The airlines wouldn't do this that are state-owned, once again, if they thought China was going to lock people down again. If they thought the, co the COVID cases were really out of control, they wouldn't do this. They wouldn't waste their own state-owned businesses' money um, if they were going to just lock down again. It's not happening the signs were there months ago, and now they're just being actually executed uh, and shown. And China had to go through a COVID phase. Every country had to go through that Omicron, highly transmissive variant uh, phase. Top 10 travel markets for China. I've discussed this before. Like I said, there's a lot of countries that rely on Chinese tourism and Chinese business. So as that opens, Thailand, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, you know, countries where up to 50, 60% of the tourists in, that go into that country are of Chinese origin. So, um, you know, it just, just kind of speaks for itself. The world reopens when China reopens. It's, it's that big of a global economy. It's that big of a business partner and export and import, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on and on. Here's the one graph you need for future demand. Human Development Index, which tells you the quality of life that people have, and the gigajoules per capita that they consume. So we have the USA up here, consuming way more per capita. We have China down here, just getting into this, what we call the S-curve. Um, you know, China's pretty far into the, the S-curve, but it's still, uh, still sort of getting there. And then all these countries, which are five and a half billion population, is still in this very low, energy consumption area. 
let's take it a bit further. Four billion of that five and a half billion are in this black box. They're on the cusp of energy, as in they're going from riding a bicycle to driving a motorcycle. By definition, that is an infinite number increase in petroleum product consumption. That over a four billion population that are right on the edge of this transition zone where your curve goes from linear to exponential and it's going to have a major major impact people still are counting this out somehow and saying world oil demand is going to fall down world energy consumption is going to fall down you know stop stop living on spreadsheets stop living on the internet go out for once see what's happening in india the fact that they're building 10,000 kilometers of highway the fact that they're building 10 to 15 airports a year like like let's let's bring things back to reality for once and what's actually happening in the world the world is nowhere close to its max energy consumption the world is nowhere close to its max oil consumption um the world is nowhere close to its max natural gas consumption we're going to consume way more here as this part of the world really comes in and keep in mind it took the us 60 70 80 100 years to really become this like industrial consumption economy it took china 20 25 30 years it's going to take the rest of the world 10 to 15 years that's that's just the way things are it gets way more efficient when people have access to the internet they know more the globalization is more you you really have this uh, incentive to have a better life uh have more access to petroleum products it's going to happen a lot quicker watch out how this plays out not it's not going to be a six month story this is a next two three five seven ten fifteen year story as countries go into this uh sort of phase um yeah 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 it is it is an s curve yes yes uh, so if we have access to energy this would keep going up at at this higher and higher exponential rate um how are we going to get there isn't that the question that that humanity is trying to solve right energy is one to one correlated to gdp it's a fact um and we're going to see can humanity find a way to produce more and more and more and more energy uh, more efficiently so far we're producing more energy less efficiently not a good place to be um and that's why things are more expensive it's just it's just supply demand. One quick point on natural gas consumption. You see the graph; it speaks for itself. And if you really look into it, the line was linear, and it looks like the slope is increasing. Not only is the percentage per year growth increasing, but the absolute value itself is now doubly increasing because you're starting off a greater and greater number every year in terms of global natural gas consumption. One that maybe the the oil or the gas bulls after their um, horrific two month uh, exercise here would like to see over kind of a longer term period. A quick point on refining, 2022 saw some closures, 2021 saw closures, 2020 saw closures. Uh, 2023 is, we're gonna have about 2 million plus barrels of global distillation capacity coming online. So really needed for the market. 2024 then has another 1.5 million barrels of new refining uh, coming online. I pray to God that these infrastructure projects go on and can actually start up on time because refining is just not having a good time right now. They're making lots of money, but as far as their, their overall uh, infrastructure and how much they need to be at, um, th they are falling behind quite a bit here. And we see that on this graph, you know, global refining capacity went up every single year, just about until 2020 hit, and then it started declining and now is on a phase back up again. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, like, I'm not even going to argue this point because um, Chinese oil consumption is is already at all time highs. There's another 150,000, 200,000 of domestic jet fuel consumption that's still coming. 
there's a 600,000 of international jet fuel consumption that's still coming. Chinese diesel and gasoline consumption was about 20% above pre-COVID in 2021. In the summer of 2021, when they weren't shut down, it was already 20% above. So 15 to 20% above. So anybody arguing that China has gone X growth, okay, their population went down from 1.426 billion to 1.423 billion or whatever, you're missing the point. There is the rest of the people that consume a one fourth the number of barrels per person um, than, than America does, uh, maybe one fifth. And they are industrializing, they are getting to a consumer economy at a very fast pace. Uh, once again, I don't want to get really into the weeds on this presentation, um, but the October 30th one talks about this a lot. And um, you know what I'll do? I'll put a Twitter post up exactly, um, I guess, showing that this narrative that China has gone X growth in terms of petroleum demand um, is just not a correct statement uh, at all. Um, and India consumption, yes, is is definitely then that on steroids, uh, for sure. Um, uh, yeah, no, for sure. We need to move energy density up to grow GDP, yes. And that's my point, is that the world as a whole should work on the other side of the problem, as opposed to trying to put out crappy products with bad efficiency and try and like band-aid the problem. It's not fixing anything. It's making it worse. Windmills and solar is never going to be a long-term solution to energy. Never. They use up way too much uh, metals and mining that we don't have and marginal scalability on a global scale. So, and they only have a 20-year lifespan. So you, you can't have stuff like that that you got to constantly redo in a, in a high energy consumption economy. Um, although we need every kind of energy right now, so I'll give them be the benefit of the doubt right now. Um, even though the EROI expected return on, on energy invested into the thing is not, not that much positive to begin with. Um, okay, so we'll get into the US shale part of things here. Uh, this is going to be a relatively fast part of the presentation. Um, I, I do have like 250 slides on this, uh, but... Like I said, this is not an insight-focused presentation. I'm not telling you what each company is doing. I'm giving you each company's maps, each company's production profile, companies to watch for, and why the Permian is now in its in its degradation phase um, of the cycle, and why it's sort of in this in this topping out phase. That unlike other shale acreages, they will not be able to maintain these levels of production for as long as maybe some of the other acreages did due to overcapitalization of what they had. And I kind of have a really good example that I thought of to, to, to share this uh, theory, but um, you know, I'll maybe leave it to one of the Twitter spaces uh, if there's further questions on this or, or maybe a future a seminar. Um, to really explain why why it is how it is, uh, but but more on a real world scenario, kind of like I did that that toilet paper example uh, earlier. So so this one was was with uh, balloons and blowing up balloons. So um, I'll I'll get to that at some point. I'm uh, digressing here. So um, yeah. So before I begin, uh, once again, anybody on Twitter Spaces that would like to join for the Zoom visuals and the Q and A session. Uh, please uh, join at whitetundra.ca. If you scroll to the bottom under events, um, you can you can join the Zoom link. If not, feel free to listen in, and the Zoom is recorded, so so you'll have that as well. Uh, yeah. So this is an, an older chart. Um, this is from oilsandsmagazine.com. They stopped updating this for some reason. This was a really good chart. Uh, so if anybody knows somebody working there, uh, please tell them to keep this chart going. And on the right side here, we have US oil rigs, about 600 rigs we're working. We are again down to this 600 rigs mark, even though we're in January. So, so just extend this line out three months uh, based on the uh, X axis here. And as far as UL product, uh, US oil production goes, flatlined. It's also at this 12, 12.1, 12.2 mark. 
uh, for the past few months. So, you know, we had this growth, we had rigs keep getting added, and now we're flatlined on rigs and we're flatlined on production. Nothing's really happening. And at the same time, I will share why that's a bad thing because asset um, assets are degrading. So the same number of rigs are drilling as a whole lower and lower quality wells. It's not instant. It's not something that changes in a week. It's something that's a month to month, quarter to quarter, year over year uh, comparison sort of thing. So watching very closely, uh, a large part of this growth that happened without rigs was because companies were bringing up old wells that they had shut in. The Gulf of Mexico added a bunch of barrels. Conventional oil added a bunch of barrels. And uh, DUCs, which I'll talk about. Here's the rig count of the last month. Flat line to possibly down. Can we make a case that it's going down? Um, yes, we can. Here's your one year rig count. You can see the growth phase, it topping out in September, October. And then in late September, when, when it looked like the market sort of fell apart uh, on, on WTI, as well as uh, the volatility and inflation in the second half of last year was you know, really intense. So we, we can definitely say rigs are dropping. You, know, you, you can see it in the trend line. There's a downward slope. It, it couldn't even hold its peak uh, for a month or two. DUCs, we had drilled uncompleted wells. ENPs love this because while they were bringing on rigs during COVID, while WTI prices were lower, supply chain issues, labor issues, they had wells that were already drilled, but not completed. So you didn't have to pay for the casing and the steel. You didn't have to pay for the drilling rig. You could just complete the well, bring it online. So we had about 8,500 DUCs in, um, when was this? This would have been about uh, going, going into... Uh, COVID pretty much. And now we're down to about 4,500. So they've used up 4,000 uh, of these DUCs already. And keep in mind, uh, DUCs are cost savings about three, $4 million a well, uh, you know, two, two to $4 million a well. So all that money that they saved, now the companies have to actually spend the money. Maybe why you see the rig count sort of try, you know, going down here where, where companies are realizing the wells made sense just to frack them. But now that we got to drill and complete them and buy the steel, maybe they're becoming a bit less uh, economic, uh, shall we say. So here you can see the, the change that happened um, over the last kind of two years, let's say now at this point. And uh, look at the Permian as well. The Permian had a more significant change where it was down almost 60, 70% in its DUC count. Uh, one point I will make on DUCs, just as I did with inventory, just because you have 4,000 plus drilled uncompleted wells doesn't mean they're all, uh, all accessible. About 12 to 1,500 of them are junk. They are wells that were drilled pre-2019. They will likely never come online. Um, and then and another 2,000 or so are working inventory. So they're drilled, but the frac, uh, uh, a crew is just waiting so that you can drill more wells and pad frack the wells. Or you wanna frack a well that's on a site where the rig is actively drilling. Like, like these are unusable DUCs that go with the rig count. So if the rig count is higher, you have more unusable DUCs. If the rig count is lower, you obviously have less. So when you take those two factors out, we effectively have zero viable DUCs left. You know, maybe 100, 200. Uh, how many in oil acreages? half of that. And how many are actually being targeted? Another half of that. So effectively, there's zero DUCs. Um, do, 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 do. Um, I actually don't know that, Zendog, if, if the Niobrara data includes the Powder River and the, uh, and the DJ, but um, you know, so far, it's just, it's just such a small portion right now uh, that we're not looking into it. But, but hey, look, it's rising. Um, because there is a little bit more activity in the PRB. Um, so, you know, one to watch, not a significant factor, but uh, should definitely look into this. The Permian is really your main one where all of this has been zeroed out. Uh, it, effectively, the only DUC left in the Permian is your working inventory uh, DUC. 
Um, yeah, so this is what Rystat is forecasting for shale. This is what 90% of people in the US probably believe uh, who care enough about oil to know what shale even is. So this is producing wells. You can see the heavy decline rate on it. These are your DUCs, which are now gone. This is a little bit of an older chart. Here's your risk drilling locations and your unrisked drilling locations. So what Rystad is saying is that not only will US production continue rising a million barrels per year, but they can sustain it for the next you know, 15 years. And when you look at graphs like this, the way you figure out all the components into one graph is the area under the curve is what we call it. So that this, this brown area, if we take the area of this shape, as in what's the actual square footage, that tells you how much oil has been produced out of the US so far, out of shale, um, light, tight oil, not just Permian, light, tight oil. The area under the entire curve is what they're saying is gonna be produced. So just extrapolate this, this curve out all the way here. And you see that, that what they're saying is we've produced less than 20%, maybe 15% of light tight oil. And the next 200 slides uh, will show you exactly why it's wrong. This, this forecast is complete wrong. And not only that, it is, it is like, it is almost fraudulently wrong. And I'm not saying that they're doing any sort of, um, you know, games or anything here, but, but really a little bit more work should have gone into this, um, in my opinion. And I got a Rice uh, subscription. I use their data. It is top notch data. Some of their shale uh, uh, information, some of their uh, data around the other countries and where the production is and storage and rigs and inflation is absolutely bang on. It's top notch. It's a forecasting game that I think some of these entities maybe should have never got into, um, including the EIA and whatnot. Uh, so again, here's the same graph broken down into the same forecast, but by basin. <laughs> and look at what they're saying. They're saying the Permian is gonna be at 10 million barrels by 2030, and they're gonna sustain that. Um, no, unless they discover some sort of enhanced oil recovery technique, which so far is not being discovered. And also, that's not how Rystar is running their modeling at all. Uh, this is just what they think is going to happen. Um, you know, we'll we'll prove this entirely wrong. I had a earlier presentation that I did uh, October thirtieth. Again, as I mentioned, where I've talked about some of the more more factors around this. Uh, this uh, today's presentation is more on acreage and visually showing you why it is geologically impossible that we've only produced fifteen to twenty percent. Uh, of all oil that's gonna come out of light tight oil. Uh, once again, you know, this is what they're saying on light tight oil, that it's just gonna, you know, go on these, uh, call it paths based on where WTI is. I don't think enough work is being put into these, these models. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, live. Frack spreads, we, we saw the rigs where they were, frack spreads, they were up 20 this Friday, so two days ago. So we're now at about 278 after our seasonal December drawdown. But 278 means we are effectively flat year over year on frac spread. So no, no real need that I'm seeing this drill baby drill mentality or frac baby frac mentality. We don't see it. We don't see a supply response um, at all here. So um We'll see how it goes. Uh, there's supply response problems, there's supply chain problems, there's labor problems still. So we'll see this play out how it goes over time. Uh, here's here's a Permian frac fleets. You see how it's down uh, in the last three or four months and um, kind of flatlined about 10% below where we were in 2018 uh, as well. Frac spreads by different formations. Oh, looking again, peaked. You're, you're about flat year over year is where we are. The Permian is roughly flat, this dark green year over year. 
you can see why the permian is such a big deal. It takes up roughly half of North American frack spreads is just in the Permian. So it's really one to focus on if we look at not, not just shale production, uh, but shale growth as well, and North American production and North American growth. Started frack operations. So again, this is some of Reistat stuff that is just fantastic. Um, so you know, as much as I give them, uh, give them a little bit of uh, a pushback here on some of their forecast, I do like their other data really, really a lot. Um, I mean, there's a reason I subscribe to them. So um, started frack operation uh, per week as well. And uh, and yeah, okay. So before I get into the real meat on the bone part of the presentation here, um, this is what I'm going to try to prove to you today is what's happened in the Permian. When you have no debt, your production profile can look exactly like the forecasts, you know, look with the forecast. It's a normally distributed curve. That's how it looks. Because they overcapitalize jail, this is my argument is what's going to happen to, to, to the Permian specifically. Um, light tight oil as well, but, but to the Permian specifically. They got to a production level that was way too high to sustain. And because they got there, whatever's coming on the other side is a much steeper decline because that's geology. You, you cannot invent rock. You cannot make bad rock into good rock. Rock is rock. It depends on the way you can produce it, yes. But we're, we're, we're pretty far into the shale cycle at this point, and we're seeing some of the efficiency gains now start to become efficiency losses in terms of uh, number of uh, meters drilled per day, uh, number of uh, lateral lengths that we can get it get to. They're starting to max out as per physics and engineering maximums, right? You can't just you can't just run spreadsheets and say we're going to drill forty mile laterals, and we're going to infill drill this and that. Like you can, but it's unrealistic in a real world uh, case scenario, and nobody's going to do these things, uh, which they're not. So we already sort of know this. Um, uh, okay. So the crux of the problem, where it all began. It all began when the USGS, the Geologic Survey, put this map out in 2017, and they said, this is the Permian oil and gas boundary. OK. Based on this, they said, we have oil for 40 years. We can sustain America for 40 years. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. OK. Immediately, what do you see? You see that less than half of the acreage has actually been drilled. There's some wells that people tried on the edges, but didn't pan out, so they didn't drill them. Okay. What does it mean? That means the area is unproductive. That's literally what it means. If, if companies are not willing to go out and drill in these areas, they're not productive land. So right away, you cut your 40 year. U.S. shale, um, sorry, Permian estimate. This is the, the Delaware Basin only, by the way. You, you can cut it right in half. 20 years is what's left. We've already produced, or no, 20 years is the total resource. We've already produced five years of it, five to six to seven years of it. So what's left? About 13 years is maybe left. A bunch of these wells in here are, are never going to be drilled because there's certain parts in the acreage within there that are not productive. There are certain parts that are not economic to 100, 120, 140, $160 oil. So naturally there, there's about 10, 15, 20% of the wells that just are not economic until way higher pricing. And when prices go way higher, there's gonna be possibly other parts of the world that become way more attractive than drilling a tier six uh, Delaware Basin oil well. So knock that down again. So you're down to what? Eight, nine, 10 years left. And remember, that's at the 5 million barrels per day mark. Four or 5 million barrels per day mark. That, that's not how production goes. It's not going to produce at five the whole way and then go to zero. It's going to be this gradual decline where the area under the curve, once again, equals the 5 million barrels per day for 10 years. But if you want to produce 5 million barrels a day uh, for 10 years, but you want to 
put it over a 25, 30 year period, now you can only produce two ish million barrels per day for that period. And that's where we get to this graph. They could have had this. They chose to get do this. This is where we are right now. And now we're running into serious um, acreage degradation issues, which I'll talk about all this. I just want to give people a bit of a upfront information why the whole shale is forever thesis is so prevalent and why people just believe it like gospel, like it's a truth, um, you know, without, without any thinking further about it. Um, okay, so there's a lot of questions here. Uh, uh, what are drilling operators offered per year on average? Uh, they make a lot of money, 100K plus, uh, solving more money. Okay, you know, how many people in your group do you know who are willing to work 3,500 to 4,000 hours a year um, in the heat, in the cold? They're willing to miss their birthdays. They're, they're willing to miss their anniversaries. Uh, they're willing to be out there where you don't know what's going to happen, dangerous jobs. Um, if you got people that are willing to do it, yeah, maybe, but uh, we, we don't have the rigs either. So we don't have supply chain either. Uh, so yeah, more money does solve the problem to an extent. But ENPs are not doing it to begin with. And even if they could, there's not enough labor uh, and supply chain out there um, to, to kind of do these things. Um, yeah. Yeah, when I used to work in the field, I was working 250 to 300, to 300 hour months. Um, consistently. And I know the, the, the service industry are much, much harder working uh, in terms of in terms of the in terms of the number of hours that they work, uh, so yeah, it's not it's not uh, uncommon to work that many hours uh, for sure. And this is not me trying to pat myself on the back. I'm telling you the reality of how the oil industry functions. We consume oil 24 seven 365. Therefore, we must produce oil 24 seven 365. USA supply as a whole. This is the uh, sorry, not as a whole. This is. What am I showing here? I, I think this is just the Permian, but I'm going to skip this slide because I show this again as well. When I look at the Permian itself, uh, what I really want to show you is the decline rates um, and what's happening here. So to put this into context for those who are joining us a little bit newer is in 2017, when they said Shell can grow a million barrels per day. Okay. What does growing a million barrels per day mean? It means you first have to make up for your production decline. So oil and gas assets decline. They'll go from X barrels to X minus some, some Y barrels uh, number over the course of a year. Okay, so from 2017, if you had to grow a million barrels per day, we just take the graph up a year and that legacy production was declining at about 800,000 barrels a year rate. So to grow 1 million barrels, you have to make up the 800,000 decline and then grow a million. So you needed effectively 1.8 million of new production to grow a million. Fantastic. Let's look at it from 2019 onwards, or, or let's go year by year. You know, we've got time. From 2018 onwards, we were at about 3.3 million barrels per day. If we wanted to grow a million now, we have to now make up 1.5 million of decline and then grow one. So to grow one, we went from needing 1.8 million barrels per day of new, new fresh production to now 2.5. Now let's turn 2019. 4.2 million barrels in one year, that declined to about 2.2 million. So a decline of 2 million barrels, plus we need our one to grow. Now we need 3 million barrels of fresh production to grow a million. And therein lies the difference between real world understanding and forecasting. The forecasting modeling is just saying, we have this many rigs, we can grow a million, that's it. There's no real work being put into understanding decline rates and how they work. If you have the same number of rigs and, and, your, and your decline number is getting higher, you can't grow a million. You can only grow a million. The next year you grow 500,000. The next year you grow 200,000. The next year you're flatlined. So that's how it, it would work in this sort of cycle. I'm gonna show you why 
the reality is much worse and what's coming is is much much worse uh, than that so effectively that's the modeling and kind of where we are today and here is the same thing shown by somebody that actually put uh, text lines that can maybe like explain what I just said but in two lines so you know circa the the production fell this much now that the, your base is higher your production is falling much more therefore to grow a million barrels per day the fresh production needs to be a lot higher the people who say shale is forever don't understand just this part of it if people just understood this part of it they would realize why shale can't grow a million barrels per day at the same rig count, at the same frac count. And now we're gonna get into the double whammy factors uh, on that. So what's happening? The late life decline rates are accelerating. So as the wells get older now, because the wells were longer, because they jammed more propent in it to get better wells, the newer wells are actually declining at a faster pace in late life. So not only is, is this production based like higher because you're declining from an absolute number, your actual decline percentages themselves are getting higher. Um, okay, that's that's one double, a double a whammy factor. Here's your shale decline rates, you know, much higher than your offshore Alaska, Campos, and Brazil stuff, much, much, much higher uh, decline rates on on this basin. Um, here's your Permian overall supply. And I'll get to the questions here just in a sec. I, I wanna make this point. Look what's happened. We had increasing well productivity every single year that we were growing production. So while we did this, where shale grew production by a million plus barrels per year, they had a bonus in that the rigs were getting more efficient they were drilling better wells. The well productivity was rising. 2022 was the first year that well productivity dropped. So we're getting, we're slowly making a case why this is where we are with the overcapitalized scenario as opposed to this. So higher decline rates, higher late stage decline, higher production decline overall because you're, you have a higher base and now your well productivity has started to drop. Not just stay, stay flat, not just that it stopped increasing, it has reversed, it has completely reversed course and dropped. When we run it on a per thousand foot lateral basis, because wells are longer, naturally you can assume that the wells are gonna get better over time. But when we normalize it, because the earth is finite. The Permian Basin extent geographically is finite. So we now have to look at it from a per thousand foot of oil produced perspective. 2022 was the worst year since 2015 for well productivity per thousand feet. When we look at it from this basis, well productivity has been declining for, for, for four or five years now. And um, getting into pretty late stage stuff here where we have now declined all the way back to seven years ago. And I'm going to prove this to you over the next few slides, looking at every single operator um, and why, why, we are, why we are in this and why the well productivity will continue to drop more and more and more. Therefore, you need, you, you need more rigs at a minimum just to keep your growth rate running let alone grow a million barrels per day and all this fancy fancy things that people are running uh, on on spreadsheets that make no sense um, when you look at it from from this what I think to be the more realistic perspective um, of where we are looking at it from a scientific math physics geologic engineering uh, side of things. I'm not going to talk about this. It's, it just talks about water production and why. Um, the Permian is producing a lot more water, which becomes into water disposal. If you want more information on this, please once again, refer back to the uh, October 30th uh, macro presentation as well. Uh, yeah, so Dirk makes a really good point. If you've ever juiced a lemon, uh, you know how this works. So uh, I like that one actually, uh, where you know 
you first squeeze it and all this liquid comes out and then it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And if you squeeze it too fast, um, you know, you, your rate looks really good and then it falls off cliff. If you squeeze it slowly, you get the normally distributed curve as I'd uh, I shown earlier. So nice one, I like it. Um, um, so let me just get to some of these questions here before I get too deep into shale, because once I do, I don't really wanna stop. I just wanna knock it out. Um, it's a whole momentum sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a comment here that there's no incentive to work in the field rather than behind a desk. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave that to each their own, but but I'll put it this way. In the Canadian oil patch, if you're working, not as a driller, but but more if you're behind a desk anyway, doing some sort of like call it professional job, and you go into the field as a field engineer uh, slash operator, like help, help, et cetera, you can make $250,000 a year within two or three years. So there's no job in, in Calgary that can get you there um, in your 20s or even in your 30s, uh, really. So there is an incentive. I would I would say that the oil patch does need people. If you're if you're curious, um, for sure something that that maybe you should uh, you know look into. Not saying, not recommending anything. Uh, just my opinion. So here I'm showing the that the fact that the real efficiency that shale has done has been increasing lateral length and jamming more prop in. That's it. That's really been the reasoning why these well productivity on an unnormalized basis looked like it was increasing, but when you looked at it from normalized basis, now it's getting to really bad declines uh, because it's been declining for many years already. A um, little bit more on Permian supply, I won't get into that. Okay, so the, the Permian oil production. Look at 2019, a clean million barrels per day growth. Very nice. 2022, about 500,000 barrels per day growth. Sounds very familiar to, to the example I just used, where at the same rig count, at the same frac count, you go from million to 500 to 200 to zero in a normalized case. I'm once again trying to argue why we're in an accelerated decline uh, to the Permian, not right away, over the next two, three, four years. Uh, one, two, three, four years. It's it's coming a lot faster um, than than also I make it seem. Um, here's your top producers in the Permian. So I I will go back to a point that somebody pushed back on me with. They said people have been saying the death of shale forever. What's what's different, right? You know this graph tells you what's different. Here's 2017. Here's 2018. 2019. Most of the companies were still growing production at a 45 degree angle. Sure, there's some that kind of slowed down a bit, but they were still growing at a 45 degree angle. Look at it today. There are some companies, two out of these 15, that are growing at a 45 degree angle. There are 10 or 11 that are flat. And there are two or three that are declining right here. Right here. So as an aggregate field, when every company is growing their production at a 45 degree angle, is there a case to be made that, that shale growth has peaked? I don't think so. I'm not saying that I was not also the one saying these things. Obviously I was not involved in the oil industry as much uh, back then, but, but there was this common belief that shale is like peaking, it's gonna die every year. People would, would come with these things and, um, Looking back in hindsight, the data does not support it. The data never supported it until late 2019, right here, where you saw the flatlining of some of these major growth, uh, growth producers. So here's your Permian wells. We see more and more wells are getting into the zero barrel per day mark. More are, are declining to lower and lower quality uh, wells which adds to operating cost as a field develops. If you have more and more and more, what we call stripper wells or sub 50 barrel per day wells, it's just more and more work. And as well, keep in mind that when some of these wells go down, 
they may never come back because the workover cost on them is just too high uh, compared to what the expected rest of the productive capacity of these wells are um, for the foreseeable uh, kind of future. So, you know, something to watch, not not super uh, relevant, but but it's, it is something I like to track it, is how many wells are, are entering this sub 100 barrel per day mark, sub 50 barrel per day mark. Uh, here's your overall wells. There are a few wells now starting to get plugged and going inactive. So this is the, uh, the other thing that's happening is that as opposed to when shale grew uh, before, now when they're growing, some wells, some older wells might be getting lost permanently as time goes on, just because of the age of the asset um, as, as a basin as a whole. So again, not meaningful right now, but meaningful enough that it should be looked at and tracked as kind of time goes on. Um, okay, I can talk about this. So the new wells, we're seeing pretty good rates on the new wells you know, 1,000 plus barrels per day of oil in the Midland Basin, 1,200, 1,300. But what you're seeing more of now, as opposed to what we did, call it two, three, four years ago, is the bad wells are, are increasing. The sub-1,000 barrel per day wells are increasing. The sub-750 barrel per day wells that may never pay out are increasing. And you're getting two to three to 5% of these absolute junk wells that produce less than 200 barrels per day, IP30. Or, or IP24, I should say. Not a good sign because those wells are what is going to screw up your growth pattern even more. As companies are running out of acreage, as they're exploring the very, very fringe uh, parts of the Delaware and the Midland Basin, just two to three to five percent wells becoming really bad, like almost abandonable wells right off the bat, rather than zero percent of wells being like that makes a big difference. The same thing in the rest of Texas, the, uh, sorry, the Delaware Basin in Texas, the wells are not good. Sub 750 day shale wells that cost seven, eight, 10, $12 million will never pay out in a 75-ish dollar environment. Higher prices, can they pay out? Sure, but they just, they're bad wells for two reasons. They, they're not economic wells. They have a really bad IRR. And, and second, you're using up rigs that could drill the rest of the remaining good acreage and you're using it to drill this junk. So, um, you know, as an oil and gas investor, I'm not complaining at all. Uh, the more I see of these wells and I don't invest in shale companies. So, um, you know, I could care less about their production results. New Mexico, Delaware Basin, kind of your, your creme de la creme. You see the wells are so good, 3000 barrels plus. Uh, but hey, all it takes is one out of the five wells that became a dud to kind of shift your entire um, average. Here's your New Mexico Delaware Basin. Once again, a really good well, a above average well, and two dud wells, right? There you go. There's your average out the window just by doing that. Um, so a little bit more. On well results, you can see what I'm trying to say is that the the overall productivity is just coming down over time, uh, and we're getting more of these these lower quality wells. Which, if you drill a few of these lower quality wells, your company might be that's it that's it for them. So it's it's also taking effectively capital outside of the sector um, because you need good wells to get a company going, and uh, some of the companies that are drilling these poor wells are your private producers and your smaller producers, and they're just not getting the good results. The good results are always Oxy, Diamondback, Pioneer, Conoco, uh, Exxon, Chevron. They're the ones that are getting the good results. You can go all the way back and just see, see these wells I mentioned who are at the top of the top. Companies with good, good acreage. The rest of the acreage is complete junk, and yet people keep uh, still keep trying to make a go at it um, in this environment. So. Anyway, same point. I don't know why I have so many, so many of these in here. I obviously, was trying to make make a point here. So, um, you can see the number of sub thousand barrel per day wells is just increasing. Um, you know, right there. That's your Eagleford Basin as well. So, 
you know, looking good. So Permian supply, this is your Permian counties. Uh, there, there's only a few that are important. Leah, Eddie, Loving, Reeves, Midland, Martin, Howard. You know, these are kind of your main ones. Upton, Ward are like your, your kind of last, last quality ones as well. So we're going to go county by county and see what's happening. So here's your, your main counties. This is well productivity index by county. You can see how the Leah and Loving and Eddie are just way, way more productive um, than a lot of the other counties. So we'll focus a little bit more on these, but you can see the main ones, the size of the bar represents how many wells are being drilled in these counties. And the length of the line is the productivity right here on top um, per well averaged out. So we'll focus on some of these counties. You can see the rest of the counties are kind of irrelevant uh, because they have lower quality acreage. Nobody wants to drill there unless oil prices went like 100, 120, 140 plus. And even then, I think it's really risky to be doing these things uh, from the economic standpoint of, of sort of running those, uh, given that it takes six months, in some cases, 12 months, by the time you decide to drill wells and by the time the well comes online. Here's the top operators. So same graph, just instead of counties, we have operators. And you can see EOG, Devon, Oxy, Conoco. These, these are your main ones. And then the ones with really good acreage, Lime Rock, BTA, BP. Some of them have just less wells that, uh, that they have. So they have really good acreage, but less acreage of it. Okay, Texas versus New Mexico. It's New Mexico that's really your growth factor right now. Texas is relatively flatlined already. So what's in New Mexico? Two counties, Leah and Eddie. And I just showed you they're the top three counties, two out of the top three counties in well productivity. Therefore, New Mexico is your big growth area. Let's divide it even further. The Permian Delaware is your growth story. Your Permian, uh, or sorry, your Texas Delaware is, has already flatlined for the past two to three years. Your Permian Midland is growing a tiny bit, uh, Permian Midland, Texas, but more so in very specific areas, which once again, we'll discuss in detail here as I go on. Um, yeah, first 12 months, uh, first 12 months from the time the well came online. So this is, this has nothing to do with years. It's just it's just the productivity of the wells over time uh, based on first 12 months of production. So here's your overall Permian by county. You can see how there's only a few main counties and I'm gonna select them out, nine of them. Once again, Eddie, Howard, Leah, Loving, Martin, Midland, Reeves, Upton, Ward. These nine counties make up 4.1 million barrels out of the 4.6 or 4.7 that the Permian is producing according to this uh, this way of measuring the production. So 85% plus is, is within these nine counties. The rest of the, how many ever counties there are, are, are relatively unknown. They've never even shown a growth profile. Like sometimes there's a county that'll come out of nowhere and just start growing. You know, we don't see them on this graph. I've taken these two green ones already, uh, I believe in my calculation. Yeah, so, so the two that are like kind of looking to start growing here, I've already taken them into my calculation, nine of them. And when we zoom in a bit to what's happening over the last little bit, you see these are the counties that, that really matter. Um, oh, I didn't know that, okay. So it's Lee County, uh, which feels strange to say, but uh, I've actually never heard anybody say the name of the county. So yeah, maybe I just been saying the wrong name for uh, for months now at this point. So. Uh, uh, I will I will verify that, but I do believe you. So so um, so I'll say that for now. Uh, so yeah, so so these are your kind of main counties to focus on. Once again, on a map, I have uh, re-shown the map here, along with the wells drilled. So you see um, up here the western part of Leah County, Eddy, Loving, Reeves. I've I've put Picos in here too, uh, as well as sort of your your Midland Basin main area, the rest, the rest is just not good. 
Like it's it's not good acreage. It's not economic acreage. Okay, so let's run through these. Uh, here's your top producers once again. Uh, just a more updated chart, uh, a little bit on premium supply and the and the lack of productivity. This is backed up by Inverus as well. So so it's not just me, uh, you know, using some software and figuring these things out. This is being backed up by Inverus and Rystat for that matter, which is even more shocking. Why their forecasts just don't make any sense because they realize what's happening according to their own data. Uh, but maybe not incorporating it, incorporating it into their model uh, effectively. Here's what I talked about: Permian, uh, like their 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 trick up the sleeve to increasing productivity was just increasing lateral length. That that that's effectively what it was uh, over the last call it ten years. Um, okay, Eddy County looking pretty good. Um, had a really nice growth phase. It flatlined in 2020. It then has this really nice growth phase once again. You can see the wells and where they are. So you know, looking pretty good. There's still open spaces between them. Uh, this is by year. So you can see the blue, the two blues, where they're drilling. They're kind of filling in the gaps right now. And, and there's still a little bit of acreage here left. Uh, just keep in mind, once again, the decline rate, right? Just because they were able to grow at this pace this year, now they got to make up for the extra 125,000 barrels of decline in this year. So it's it's all my comments on the overall Permian production are the same on a county by county level, are the same on a company by company level. Like those those decline rate analysis doesn't really change uh, all that much. So you know, looking pretty good. Here's your overall um, sort of Eddy County and and what's happening. You can see how. People are really wanting to target this lower corner. As you get to, further to the um, northwest, there's just less drilling. It's it, it's not as productive. It's the fringe area. So you see there's there's gaps. This area was drilled in 2012, 2013, and it's been ignored largely since. This area has very few 2021, 2022 drills, the blue and the dark blue. So really it's this little pocket and this little pocket uh, that we're focusing on. So there's still a little, little bit of growth that can come out of Eddy County for sure. Um, how long can they maintain it? We'll see how much they want to overcapitalize it. <laughs> really is a question for, for all shale uh, at this point. So on the acreage map, you can see certain companies are getting filled up and they're moving here. This is Exxon, uh, I believe in red. Uh, and then certain companies have a little bit more open space, uh, call it down here, and um, you know even even some of this blue acreage here, but getting pretty filled up. You know, Eddy County, it it's going to have growth. I'll admit, I'll admit that you know straight up. Well, productivity is going down, so you know once again we see the same trend that not only is there a higher decline rate that you have to take care of. From a higher base, but well productivity is dropping. So always gotta remember the first, the best acreage is always drilled first. So what's left here is gonna get less and less productive. Growth is still gonna be out of Eddy County. Yes. Uh, this is the same graph on a cumulative fashion. So instead of looking at uh, well rates, we look at cumulative, how much they totally produce. And you can see the impact of higher decline rates that some of these graphs the lines cross over because they come on stronger, but the decline rates on them are higher. So they end up cumulatively, accumulatively producing uh, less oil. No, yeah, this is just oil. I'm, I'm not talking about gas, this is just oil um, because that's all I really care about in, in terms of shale uh, supply demand, right? So here's Howard County. You can see it had more growth, but it's a very flat line growth now. And then it had a big, you know, another growth level phase when a lot of wells came online. So you can see that here, a lot of the drilling that happened, this, this blue, this light blue was in 2021 and 2022. And therein proves my point of a higher absolute base. You see how they were able to grow production in these three years? And they, you know, yeah, they drilled wells, but not that many wells. Whereas in 2022 or 2021, to, just to keep production flat, they had to drill up a lot, lot more wells. So 
it's coming. Uh, here's your Howard County. You see how it's relatively pretty uh, beaten up at this point. There's a couple producers with, with open acreage here uh, in pink, but, but the real core of the core is getting filled up and uh, quite rightfully so. Uh, one point I will make because people will push back on this. There's not just one zone in the Permian. There's multiple zones, uh, including multiple in the wolf camp and the strawberry. Uh, but but at the same time, only some of them are productive in certain areas. It's not like you can dr drill a Permian stack formation everywhere. And in fact, there's very little places where you can drill a Permian stack. So things are getting filled up. And we know that because wild productivity is dropping. Like if the if the acreage was still fresh with new zones with with reservoir pressure, um, well productivity would would not be dropping at the pace that it is. Um, yes, yeah. So I'll make another point here. I'm not talking about is the company making money or not. I don't care. Is the company growing production economically? Doesn't matter. Did they save half a million dollars on completion cost? And that's why their IRR is much better. I don't care. What I'm trying to show you is on a overall Permian production standpoint, not economic standpoint, production standpoint, uh, what's happening. But but I do appreciate th that I should share that fact because there are companies that are doing really well, um, even still. Here's how Howard, Howard County productivity. One of the things here they've gotten is you can see a little bit better productivity actually in Howard County. Um, so they have discovered a little bit of sweet spot area here uh, that's that's going really well for them, yet they were still only able to maintain production in 2021, barely. So we'll see how long this lasts, what what the growth phase here. But in Howard County is, is relatively low productivity wells, so I don't think it's going to grow much further. You know, a little bit of growth here can stay at 350, 375,000, and it'll stay there. Lee County, very, very productive, very nice growing. You can see how the entire Eastern half unusable. There's gaps here in the middle as well. We can see this uh, when we look at the open acreage map. So people have acreage in this area. They just refuse to drill it because it's not good. Um, Leah County has seen the biggest drop in productivity on a per barrel um, kind of absolute barrel uh, metric. When your biggest, most productive acreage sees the largest drop in productivity out of all of them, that tells you you're overcapitalizing your asset for sure. You're 100% overcapitalizing this asset. You're, you're putting money where it's best put in the most productive acreage, but you're overcapitalizing it. The pace of development is too fast and you're seeing these massive drops in productivity. Now, this is unnormalized. For, for, for Lee County, I. I put in unnormalized uh, productivity just to show you that when you normalize it, we are at 2015 levels of well productivity in Lee County. Higher up, higher down. The graph I showed earlier with the with the normalized distribution curve and the the other curve. So this is one county that I think can still grow because the wells are so good. It is by far the most productive. Um, a county, but I think its death is going to be a lot more fast and sudden, and possibly um let let's say late 2023 would be mid to late 2023 is when you really start seeing this uh, in in some of the production profiles and how they go. Cumulative, look at 2022 and the drop in uh, cumulative the graph where it's going, significant significant, um so definitely. Definitely want to track. I think I think this one is one that people are maybe too bullish on, um, and we'll see we'll see how it plays out because I do think it has been overcapitalized. It's it's producing eight hundred thousand barrels from one county. So naturally, I mean this is creme de la creme. Um, Loving County is our is our next case where counties have flatlined now. Once again, you see how many more wells were required in the last two years compared to the previous year and the year before that and the year before that, right? It's it's just getting more and more filled up. The nice thing about Loving County, there's still some open uh, acreage here. So it can maintain this maybe for a little bit longer, but the growth phase is gone, it's dead. 
this county is not going to grow. It's going to be flatlined uh, at best. And you see that there's there's certain holders that have a lot of acreage that they're slowly just, just capitalizing here. I can also see that certain producers have smaller acreage, so they have to drill less uh, lateral well lengths than some of the other acreages. Um, so here's a Loving County productivity drop, pretty significant once again from 2021 and uh, what's happened here. And what I'm gonna do for the rest of the presentation here is just breeze through the slides and just show you why on the aggregate, yes, there are one or two or three counties growing, but the rest of them are flatlined and there's some now that are declining. So cumulative, once again, here's Martin County, basically flatlined now at 2022. Uh, here's the map. And, and this is more, the rest of the presentation here will be more for the people who wanna review it and just pause and have a look at the maps more clearly because if I said the same thing on every map, you would just get bored uh, um, and, and uh, you know move on. So uh, this Martin County loss of productivity again here on this one. Just just pay attention to how many counties or companies is well productivity increasing. The answer is less than one handful. Um, so and that's across Permian, Eagleford, and Bakken, not not just Permian. A productivity going down. Uh, once again, here's a Midland, your your big daddy of the. Uh, midland part of the Permian. Slight growth, nothing major. It was already flatlining uh, pre-COVID, pretty filled up acreage. And uh, um, I'll let the graph sort of speak for itself where this is not the first year of productivity decline. This is the fourth or fifth year. Um, and that's when things really, really pile up uh, as to where we're headed. Uh, same thing with, with cumulative. You have the worst well since 2015, once again, and it's only getting worse and worse. Um, and the open area in your counties is getting less and less uh, and less. So Pico's Basin, this is your other case where production has dropped. So even though there's, there's production growing in certain counties, there are many counties where it's actually dropping now, which then on an aggregate, produces what we know as the Permian production overall. So this county is basically dead at this point. Um, nothing is gonna happen. It's it's down from 100,000 barrels, 110,000 barrels per day in 2020 to about 65,000 now, 70,000. So it's already on its, on its decline. Um, does this look like a normalized graph to you? Like, like a normal distribution that comes like this? No, it looks like they overcapitalized and now it's going to fall off a cliff. So, yeah, may maybe I should have it a bit more zoomed in uh, to prove that point, but um, you can see how fast things decline. We're down 40% from the high in three years and not a good sign. Uh, here's your Picos County once again. And, oh man, like, it just even hurts to look at this well productivity, how far it's fallen uh, from, from sort of the peak. Cumulatively, not just, just nobody's even bothering to drill here. These wells are, are, are just done though at this point. You need higher pricing just to make it worth maintaining production, let alone grow production. Reeves County, similar thing. This thing dropped from, from December 1st, or yeah, from December 1st of 2019, to today, it's down about 150,000 barrels already. So just looking at Lee and Eddy County, you know, I started off with that because there is certain counties that are still growing, but there's a lot of it, which is at best flatlined, much below its peak, and probably has more decline yet to go. Uh, Reeves, right there, you look at the cumulative graph, just look at how fast it's it's moving down even like it's it's not that it's below the other graphs it's that it's even declining a lot higher Upton growing it had a big growth spurt in early 2022 effectively flatlined getting pretty filled up in your main areas still a little bit of openings not bad actually doing good here on the productivity uh, index you know pretty pretty mid tier here's ward 
flatlined for a few years, now declining, and uh, a little bit more open space here. Again, same point. I don't want to repeat myself. I just want to give you data that shows to you that on the aggregate, just looking at stuff on the aggregate doesn't doesn't prove the point. You have to see it on a one by one basis and and kind of what's happening here. Let's look at it by company instead of by county. So we 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 showed the top nine counties and what's going on there. Now we'll look at the uh, top fifteen or twenty companies in the Permian. You know, EOG had this massive growth phase, but look at their acreage and how drilled up it's getting, especially the core. Lee County acreage, you can barely see the edge of the acreage. It's getting so drilled up. Um, okay. Yeah, there's no multilateral drilling as far as I know in the uh, Permian uh, or in any sort of tight formation to begin with, uh, especially to this size. Um, and yes, the earthquakes and all that, I talk about that in my October 30th uh, presentation. So if, so if you do want to I have a look at that. Um, I do discuss that in, in much clearer detail, uh, the seismic index and whatnot. So, so here's EOG, right? And the reason I pick on EOG is because they talk about we have 10,000 drilling locations, okay? Where are your drilling locations? Like, like, look at where they are. On the edge, absolute edge fringe of Eddy County, up here, I believe this is Chavez, unusable. You know, stuff down here, I believe this is Loving County, you know, not, not as good as Leah, obviously. So always be careful when companies say we got this many drilling locations. It, it doesn't mean like anything, to be honest. You really have to dive deep and figure out, is it actually good acreage? Are the wells actually what they're saying they are? Or are they just extrapolating off results in their core of the core of the core? So, you know. A little bit open space, yeah, but but this package especially is is the one that 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 resulted in this growth, uh, and is where it is. So once again, well productivity dropped from 2021, and uh, this is unnormalized. This is normalized. You can see why EOG has a massive problem on their hands in terms of keeping their production, you know, at the pace that it was or meeting their targets that they set to people um that that they were going to hit so just for those who are on twitter who are not seeing this uh the well productivity for eog normalized looks like it's trending to be five percent below 2021 and 2021 was already about 40 to 60 percent below the highs um that they had in 2016 um so i'll let you take that where you will Cumulative graph as well. Uh, unnormalized, you know, kind of doesn't look all that bad when you normalize it. Yeah, these are not double premium inventories. This, this is, you're fooling investors here. Uh, Devin, big growth phase, now declining. Why? Their core is all filled up. Devin was the one talking about, we have these 10,000 barrel per day wells and we're going to absolutely absolutely killed the game and all this. Yeah, they had a few really good wells that allowed them to grow at these extreme paces. And now it's already declining. It, it couldn't even maintain the top. It's already going down because look at how filled up these main uh, core of the core packages are, okay? And effectively the rest of the presentation is making the exact same point by showing you each company that matters and each county that matters. Devin, well productivity, same thing here, Occidental, grew, and now already down about 25% from its peak and barely staying flat. That's all it can do. And it correlates to geology and engineering. You've drilled up your best lands. You now are just filling in stuff. Productivity, you know, looking pretty good actually. Occidental's done a good job at, at, uh, at their well productivity, but uh, they are misleading investors. They are jacking up the initial production rates by letting these wells flow without any sort of control. And then look at the decline on them. This is production operations that is like low, 
lo lowest ten uh, lowest decile uh, production operations management. They really wanted to make their production look good. That they bought good acreage. That they have good acreage. So the IP rates look great. The IP sixties look great. And then the entire well just falls off a cliff after hitting bubble point death much faster than their wells used to. So this is why when I did my Monty presentation last week, I said, I want every company to report IP 30, 60, 90, 180, and 365, and 730. So you have a full idea on every single well. So you have a full idea as to what's actually happening through the well's entirety um, of making money and also just producing. So if your company's wells look like this on shale profile, um, they're not producing it properly. This has significant long-term consequences in terms of reservoir uh, pressure maintenance and your well itself, its productive capacity. Uh, so enough about that. Uh, so here's the, once again, the cumulative graph. Here's Conoco, a little bit slower pace of production and now in a terminal decline. Once again, the main, the main acreage has been produced. Um, well productivity, lowest it's ever been in the last five to seven years, since 2015, declining again. So I want to make one point here. When shale production was growing, look what was happening to productivity, right? Like going up, going up, 2018 again up. And then is when the decline started and, and started the problem this is why I like shale or oil and gas investors got into oil pretty heavily in, in the fall of 2019 is because this data was getting more and more obvious. Now there's another two years, uh, three years of acreage that's been used up and the productivity continues to decline. So the case for shale is just becoming more obvious if you are willing to look into it and sort of what's coming as opposed to um, just look at the overall base in production and say, you're wrong, shale is still growing. Yeah, okay, it's fine. What's the trend line gonna look like as time goes on? Pioneer, your big producer in the Midland Basin, growth, 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 flatlined. Still have still have a bit to go, but, but keep in mind, they have to maintain 500,000 barrels uh, of oil production for the next however many years in the blank spots that are there. The blank spots are not growth spots. The, the blank spots is their entire acreage that's left. So they have to maintain production using just what's remaining. And you can kind of see the graphs or the acreage maps. I repeat my point. Does this look like there's only 15% of the oil has been produced? I'm not talking recovery factor. I'm talking what can be produced at this point in time. To me, it looks like 50% plus. 40% plus, um, which gets us to our original estimate on, on how much shale is really left. And uh, look at Pioneer's well productivity. Ooh. Lowest, once again, lowest since 2015. It is dropping like a rock. It doesn't stop. The productivity declines don't just stop here. There's 2019, there's 2020, 2021, 2022. What does it mean? You need more rigs for the same amount of production. You need more frac crews and you need more acreage. Most importantly, you need more acreage. You don't have the acreage. There's, there's a geology part of, of this all. Um, Exxon does have a little bit of acreage. They have a very sustained development plan. They don't want to increase production to these massive levels. Even though they say they do, it's BOEs they're talking about, not BBL uh, barrels. So... They've got a bit of acreage. They're going to slowly produce this. They've learned from everybody else, and they're going to slowly produce this over the next 10 years. Keep it relatively flat here, 300 to 400,000 barrels per day, and just produce it for a while. So they're not doing the drill baby drill because they've learned from the mistakes of their peers. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. So... Yeah, like Oxy has other benefits, um, but I wouldn't say that the shale like production itself is a is a really good um, you know thing uh, as a as a standalone uh, entity. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, for sure. So Exxon doing, doing relatively well, actually, because like I said, Exxon and Chevron were two companies that just waited. They they kept their core permian acreage to let the other people develop it. And then they developed it to some level, which are going to keep flat for a lot longer than their peers who are running out of acreage or have already run out. Here's Diamondback in its cash harvesting cycle, filled up acreage. Like this one is absolutely um, qu quite filled up. And I think it's going to start its decline phase here soon. Um, that's why they're making all these acquisitions that they're doing because they, they know what the problem is. When, when companies end up in this position, they start making acquisitions that are supposedly accretive. Um, and it's, and it's kind of obvious. And I'm talking about shale companies itself. Uh, other companies make acquisitions for other reasons, but shale companies themselves, uh, if their assets were so good, they, they shouldn't need to pay $75,000 of flowing barrel, uh, to buy other shale acreage. Uh, in their area. So, you know, Diamondback's actually done a very nice pace of development uh, while productivity is largely hanging in there uh, so far, but they're running out of acreage either way. They still blew up, you know, 2020, 2021, 2022, 300,000 barrels of production is now gone uh, per day and has been produced. Newborn, your big private grower. So 2021, they really ramped up. 2022, they ramped up further. This is one that can actually grow a little bit. They, they still have some uh, acreage here uh, in the Delaware Basin, but I don't expect them to go too much higher than, than here. And this is what I was talking about when I started the presentation, that uh, despite all these production that's been added in the last two years, the inventory situation still looks bleak, right? So we've taken out our low-hanging fruit, and we still are where we are, are right here. Um, well, productivity. And now I'm just going to run, like run through these slides unless I have something to say. Um, and then people on the recording can sort of more really dive deep into it. But but we're already three hours into it. I didn't even realize. Um, so I think I want to kind of get get to it here. Uh, Mewborn, here's Chevron. You can see similar, have a lot of acreage uh, still open. They, like Exxon, saved their acreage and want to just maintain a nice, nice kind of production profile rather than overcapitalizing. Uh, look at their well productivity is, is already down despite them having you know quite a lot of acreage. It's not in the core Lee and Eddy County and it's not in the core of the Midland. Um, and a little bit that is, they've, they've already kind of fully filled it up already, but they still have some openings for sure. Cotera, another producer would just merged, I believe, and became bigger. Uh, you can see flat since 2018. Not much left here. It's it's just get all getting filled up. Um, wealth productivity actually is at all time highs. Uh, so they've they've obviously discovered a sweet spot in a certain place. But when you only have this much acreage left, the sweet spot it just gets less and less chance that it makes a material difference. And we see that in the production rate. Despite that wealth productivity, their production didn't grow. So you run into lower and lower sort of chances that you can ever kind of come back. You've you've already drilled up your best acreage, your most productive wells, your cheapest wells, yada, yada. Um, yeah, pretty nice here, actually. Cotera is doing, doing a good job there. Whatever they've done, uh, their well productivity in 2022 is, is looking really good. Uh, Endeavor, your other private producer, got up to 200,000. They had this big growth phase, just like Mewborn. And now they're going to just keep it flat here. 250,000-ish barrels per day. Uh, you can see they don't really have the acreage to grow too much more and then and then still keep going. This is also Midland Basin producer. Uh, on aggregate, the Midland Basin is about 30 to 40% lower quality than the Delaware Basin. So these producers anyway are going to only want to get to a certain point. And they've already had their growth phase. They've, they've just about doubled production in just two years. So, you know, now they got to, again, the whole decline rate phenomena on a higher base with lowering well productivity, you know, as we kind of see, look, looking kind of decent here actually on, on this company. Uh, Permian Resources fully drilled everything here. They got a few packages here, relatively flat. Uh, um, I'll let this graph speak for itself um, and this one as well. So 
worst the worst productivity they've seen by far. It's it's not even close to 2015. It's it's way worse than 2015. And you can see why. You know they they probably have some fringe acreage somewhere here that they're drilling. That's that's not actually good because they've drilled up all their all their core entirely at this point. Uh, Crown Quest. Um, there you go. This acreage is basically useless. I'd mentioned earlier, you want to focus on the main counties. All this acreage that's that's in some other place um, may not be true acreage. And you can tell they've never even drilled a well here so far. So these are ones that you, you would watch for for significant decline because they have literally nothing left uh, at this point. And that's dropping. And that's dropping. Oventiv, similar story lowest well productivity in years. SM Energy, here are your producers that are gonna decline from now on forever, in terminal decline. They have no acreage left, zero. It's all just stuff that they jacked up production in 2021, wanting to get bought out. Nobody bought them out. Now they got no, no acreage left. And because it jacked up their production, it's gonna come down as it did. So all this efficiency gain or all this production growth they had in 2021, we are now to 2018 levels of production. You can see how fast things can unravel when you're running these sorts of treadmill schemes and, and running the treadmill at a higher inclines, running the, uh, running the treadmill at higher speeds. You, you can keep it up up to an extent and then the, the entire thing unravels uh, as we see in certain companies now already. Um, so I won't talk too much about that. Tap Rock Operating, yeah, very similar story. Grew their production massively, looking for a sale, couldn't get a sale, and production is now down, what, 20 to 30% in the last three months because they have literally nothing left. They've drilled, they've drilled their boxes so much that you can't even see the outline of the acreage holding anymore. Um, yes, Mewborn is a pot is a uh, family oil company. Yes, correct, yeah. Um, uh, okay, no, this is great. Uh, so I just got a comment here that Cotera got their Marcellus reserve slashed by 33% as well. So yeah, the reserves are also gonna get smashed uh, as this goes on because the well productivity is going down, which translates uh, effectively into reserves. Um, so yeah. So anyway, here's a company that's not going to decline forever. They have literally nowhere left to grow. Uh, Matador, another growth producer, they do have a little bit of uh, acreage, not core, fringe stuff. So, you know, we'll see where they get to, but, but you'll see it's again starting to flatline here. And that, huh, you know, when you really look into it, this thing has been declining for, for a few years, but they were able to make up for it because the sheer size of the Permian and the productivity is so good um, that even with declining productivity, they were able to make it. Now that acreage has been drilled up and the productivity is falling so much that they're in the spinning phase soon to get into the time when they crash off the treadmill um, and fall over. Here's Novo Resource and other small, very, very small companies that are running this model where they wanna build up and then sell. They're running out of acreage. Uh, really, uh, Franklin Mountain, same thing. You know, like they're they're to their benefit. They've got to about forty thousand barrels per day. It looks like in two years, but it looks like they're they're drilling this pattern. And unfortunately, the private producers don't reveal their acreage in some cases. So I don't have the full knowledge of what's happening here. Um, but for the most part, these wells never show up in the top well drilled lists uh, at all. So. It's just other acreage. Maybe they found a sweet spot. There's there's not much like juice left uh, even to find sweet spots because a lot of it has, has already been discovered, drilled, produced, and consumed. Uh, Kaiser Francis. <laughs> so here's what happens uh, when you, again, grow, looking for sale, and then you run out of acreage, your production drops 50% in a year. So, so there are private companies that are growing but there's also private companies that are completely out of acreage and now just gone. Um, I won't talk too much about that. Lime Rock. Here's a more extreme example of a private producer that never made it. 
they effectively at this point are just letting their production decline to zero, no acreage left. They got to 30,000 barrels in 2018. Now they're producing seven or six and zombie company is dead. Nobody probably, are, I don't know the, the I don't know the shale M&A patch that well, but I don't think this has any appetite in the M&A market. Uh, a declining zombie company that has nothing left and 6,000 barrels per day of declining production. And there's more and more of these companies that are now coming up. Um, Birch is actually growing a bit, um, but, you know, again, it's it's just a matter of there, there's no acres left. And companies that choose to grow are going to have that acre that acreage depleted to the point that they can't keep up that growth. And then it starts falling a lot faster on the other side um, as well. Black Swan, a newer producer, drilled a few wells, found a little sweet spot, you know, 15,000 barrels per day. Where does it go from here? Nobody knows. Very limited acreage. And uh, now they got all this decline to deal with. And Henry Resources, um, you know, Show me the blank spots in the acreage, tiny, tiny little packages where you need to build infrastructure, pipelines, well pads, may not even be economic. And Summit, this is the last one I'll talk about in the Permian. So they had their growth phase and now they stay there. And these companies collectively are, I don't know, 85, 90% of Permian production that I just talked about, these 24 companies. Um, maybe not quite that high, but but it's definitely up there. Uh, and, and I also picked every high growth company in each of those nine top uh, counties that I talked about. I picked the top growing companies in them, any privates that were growing, and I put them in here. So what you're seeing, the companies that I showed that were growing, and you're maybe getting a bit concerned, those are the only growth companies in those entire nine counties that matter. And we talked about them in 15, 20 minutes. So, um, yeah, here's your summit productivity. So shale supply, Permian, Delaware, you take those out, the rest of shale is flatlined. There's there's not too much going on here. Um, so uh, yeah, Kaiser Francis, yeah, it's a real company. Um, I don't know about the naming convention. I'd like, there's, there's a lot of different names in the US that are uh, definitely unique. Uh, Yeah, they do free up rigs um, for sure, but there's only so many rigs and there's only so many people that want to drill uh, these these sort of fringe wells as these private companies are now finding out. they When they know now that the M&A can't really happen, now they just want to you know, keep keep things stable. Nobody's really all that interested in, in, in really increasing production other than Endeavor and Newborn, which, which have the scale uh, and the size to do it. Eagleford, this is kind of, you know, what's what's going to happen, but even faster because the Eagleford was not overcapitalized. It was it was this normally produced, and it still had this big decline uh, phase. You know, overall production pretty much flatlined here. Well, productivity normalized. It is once again the worst since uh, 2015 here in the Eagleford. It's dropping every single year as it has a few a few inactive wells popping up. Um, the same graph that I showed earlier. Here's your top producers. You can see it's in a bit more advanced stage where there's no company growing and some of them are flat, some of them are declining. So not much happening here. Here's your Eagleford counties. Um, well productivity by, by company. So we see the top three producers, a few other ones that, that drill a lot of wells. Um, here's your best county. DeWitt and Carnes are by far the best counties here. It's it's really not even close. And then there, there's some other counties that people are drilling. Some of these lines are thicker because they're gas counties. So people still drill a lot of wells and the oil productivity is lower. So the exact same template that I did for the, uh, for the Permian, I'm gonna run through the exact same for the Eagleford and we're just gonna breeze through this. Uh, I, I really wanna try and wrap this up. Uh, not too much longer. So all Eagleford top counties make up more than 80% of the production. These uh, six counties, 1.1 million, 1.2 million, 
around 1 million is coming from these uh, six counties. And look how it's, how it's like starting to decline pretty rapidly at this point. Um, DeWitt County, uh, the, uh, this is one of the, this is the product, most productive county in the Eagle Ford. It's in its death phase. It's production is already down about 60% since the 2015 high, fully drilled up. There's really nothing left here. It's just gonna decline into oblivion. Uh, well productivity continues to drop as expected, which creates a double whammy. There's there's the decline and the new wells that you're trying to make up for the decline are just getting worse and worse. Carnes County, second best in the Eagleford, flat, no, no, no signs of growth here. And once again, well productivity continues declining. Dimit County in its uh, Zombie phase as a county itself, just just it's just going down. Um, productivity continues to drop. McMullen, same old story. Gonzalez, kind of flat, but very similar story. Well, productivity is absolutely atrocious. It's down almost forty percent since the highs. Um, LaSalle County. So what I'm saying is gonna to happen to the Permian is not without precedent. This has happened in other shale plays earlier. It's happened in, in other shale plays that were not overcapitalized. Because the Permian is overcapitalized, the, the death phase happens a lot steeper and a lot faster. Um, of course, once again, barring any technological innovation um, that occurs. You, like, like look at this well productivity in LaSalle County. It used to produce 80, barrels per thousand foot IPs, it's now down to 35, 40. Yeah, so so at this point, what happens is ENP stop investing in wells in these counties, even though they have infrastructure, they have production, they just stop investing and, and it goes on this slow death to zero barrels per day whenever it gets there. Uh, company by company, same thing, EOG and acreage. Well, productivity. I think I'm I'm starting to sound like a broken record now, um, you know. But but this is this is the reality of shale. This this is what shale has done. They have screwed up the climate, uh, the environment climate, or the the investment environment for eight years. All the while making no money, they screwed up the conventional oil development cycle, and they overcapitalized to a point that what's what's coming on the other side in terms of declines uh, is something that that I don't think the world can handle. Um, and meanwhile, there's people that still believe that shale is going to grow another five million barrels in the next five years, right? And you can you can start to get a sense of why I'm so confident in my investment allocations and my macro is because it's not just that it's obvious. It's that I could have two or three things slap me out of nowhere. And the supply demand picture is just not looking good to, you know, one, two, three, five years out. Not that it looks good today by any means. And what else happened? They blew their band-aids as in their SPR and the DUCs and the Fed's funds rates, hikes and all this. They blew all those bullets in their chamber already. They're already gone in 2022. I don't mind it at all because now that those are gone, I can invest with way more confidence. Again, this is not investment advice. I'm sharing my own opinion of, of sort of how I interpret this, the situation we're in um, and why I'm not really concerned about people, um, you know, victory lapping about the last six months of, of 2022. Um, I'll hear out every bear case on supply demand. They talk about Guyana, they talk about Brazil and all this. And it's like, the gap is just too large at a time when 4 billion people are entering the S-curve. So. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that's kind of where I am um, on that, which I've which I've shared I I think pretty passionately and aggressively uh, over the last couple of years through my Twitter feed and these these YouTube sessions and whatnot. Uh, so Conoco, uh, this is what it is, and I just want to make one example with Conoco. Like when people say, oh, they can just uh, increase production in one of these other you know little acreage packages they have that's been undrilled. This is what happens. They find out the wells are junk and they drill a four, five, six well pad just to try it out. 
production gets to 5,000 barrels per day. And within a year, it's down to 1,200 barrels per day. Within two years, it's down to 500 barrels per day. And then nothing ever happens. So it's just, it's just like, look at the decline rate here. When you start drilling more and more fringe wells, your decline rate goes through the roof. Your productivity goes through the uh, floor, um, if you will. Um, okay. Again, same thing. I'm not going to har harp on this horn here. A marathon, you know, again, they do have some some acreage in, in DeWitt, which is a partner acreage. So it shows as undrilled, but a bunch of this has been drilled. Um, and you see how they've completely overrun their Carnes acreage. They do have some opening still. Uh, marathon, of course, the JV with, with Baytex. So um, we'll kind of see how they do, but relatively keep in production flat here. Uh, productivity, Chesapeake, huh, down. This is more gassy acreage, but but still, their oil production is down about 50% in three years um, in the Eagleford. There's that. Devon basically completely gave up uh, at this point. Not, not much happening. Uh, BP doing what they can. They've got a bunch of acreage, but in poor quality, uh, a poor quality, call it... Um, counties once again this is partner acreage so it does show as undrilled but but this part of dewitt has been drilled um as far as i i know if i can just eyeball it here um well productivity enzyme you can see what happens to companies once they enter the death spiral uh 2015 production it's now down pre-covid it was down almost 80 percent so once it declined and you don't put money into it you stop running on the treadmill, you're going to get absolutely pushed off it right away and uh, production falls off a cliff. Uh, yeah, Enzyme, here's Inpex, bit of a growth producer, very private or very small, very small acreage position. So, you know, not, not too much more they can add here. Just not enough acreage at all to do anything here. Same case, SM is growing a bit in the uh, Eagleford, mostly gas. So they have these, these edges of the gas acreage left. Can you take a guess that well productivity is gonna keep decreasing here? Because you can just see from their development pattern what they're doing and where they're going. Um, so, and yeah, that's the one thing I haven't even talked about is the asset retirement obligations on these wells. Nobody knows at this point you know, when the economic down um, down of these wells is, the, the economic endpoint and what the asset retirement obligations are going to look like. Uh, of course, the U.S. being a bit more lax than, than Alberta, uh, but still something to, to kind of keep in mind as the entire investment community changes to these ESG metrics and, and ARO and whatnot. Um, SM, here's Magnolia, a little bit of acreage in Carnes, pretty flat. Here's Mesquite. Uh, this is what a uh, death spiral looks like if you want to see one. Uh, group production couldn't even maintain it flat for like three months. And in the corresponding seven years, production's down 75%. Nothing they can do at this point. It's, it's, they got no acres left. It's a reality of the rock. It's a reality of geology. So for those who are maybe doubting a little bit, as I was talking about the Permian, you were saying, oh, you know, maybe, uh, Maybe I'm just maybe have this bullish view on everything while I'm showing you the Eagleford and what happened to these acreages when exactly what happened, what I talked about with the Permian, when the geology and the acreage ran out. This is what happened. Okay, so um, I think I got, got about another 15, 20 to 30 minutes left here. So I'm just going to power through and... Um, and get this done here. Maybe a short Q and A session, and then we'll we'll continue the conversation on on Twitter Spaces. Uh, not today, I mean, but but on the future Spaces, we can talk about shale and stuff more if people have questions. So the Bakken, an even more degraded acreage uh, than the Eagleford, you, you kind of see that in the overall trend lines here. You know, relatively flat, can't grow much. Late life declines also also accelerating in the Bakken. Um, well, productivity actually has increased here after a couple of years of decline, 
So they have found a couple new sweet spots, uh, doing some delineation work, doing some step out drilling. So, you know, maybe a little extra little, um, I call it injection in them. But on the overall, this thing is, is so far down its maturity life cycle that not much can be done. Uh, here's the same graph normalized, you know, so still pretty good productivity actually at a concentration. So the vast majority of the acreage has ended up in a few companies' hands and they're they're running some new kind of drilling techniques, fracking techniques, and uh, and seeing what happens. At the same time, inflation is up 20, 30, 40% on DCET. So keep in mind, you know, there's there's just less of an appetite to go into these mature acreages as opposed to something new. Top companies, an even more mature phase of the of the uh, shale boom. No company is growing just about. Most of them are actually in their declining phase now, you know, not even flatlined, uh, including the, the big ones. Way more inactive wells, way more plugged wells, way more wells under 100 barrels per day. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so there's other shale acreages that are still left, but they're just not the Permian. They're, they're not the Eagleford. They're not the same level of productivity. So they need 110, 120, $140 to really need full scale development. And I just don't think we're there yet because even if we got there, um, you need less volatility and you need companies where their equity price reflects a valuation that makes them want to drill uh, and explore. So we're, we're just not, not there yet. And it's gonna take a while. And by the time we get there, the geology of these other acreages could be so degraded that overall U.S. production um, has kind of hit a, I'm not going to say a forever peak, but but it's definitely peaked for this part of the cycle, uh, barring, again, any technological step changes. Here's your North Dakota oil production. You can see the production per well is just dropping as time goes on, which adds to operating costs. It leads to inefficiencies. It leads to wells just being shut in because they'd rather uh, drill the new wells than take care of these older wells. And each time a well gets shut in, you lose two, three, five, 10, 15 barrels forever um, if the well is abandoned uh, from then on. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just about done here. So again, top counties, top companies. Uh, there's only four counties that matter in the Bakken. So Dunn, McKenzie, Mount Rail, Williams, look at Dunn County, was kind of your growth 2018, 2019. Now it's down. Uh, productivity is looking pretty good here actually so far. So uh, definitely discovered a, a few new, um, I call it sweet spots. And um, yeah, so Dirk makes a great point here that I wanna address. So I'm not saying that we've ran out of oil. I'm not saying that the companies are going to be zeros. What I'm saying is the rock that's left and the supply demand situation we're in will lead to a new higher floor and a new higher range of oil pricing. And now whether, you know, I think it's between 120 and 150, let's say, or whether you think it's something else, it doesn't really matter. The, the point is we need a higher pricing regime and the market is going to force us there despite political interference, despite SPR barrels dumping on the market, despite recession risk, despite the federal funds rates, all that, it, it really doesn't matter at, at some point here sooner than later, it's just not gonna matter. The true rock quality, geology, engineering, and supply demand will just take over until they bring us to a new high range and then financial markets can then adapt around that. Uh, once again, McKenzie County, it's kind of on its death phase at this point, uh, not much happening. Well, productivity actually in the Bakken is still staying pretty consistent, which is which is quite interesting to watch uh, that happen. The, the one thing that the Bakken never did was drill like these huge long wells that the Permian is. So there is still a lot of opportunity to go in and, and do infill drilling um, and redrills and refracts and whatnot uh, as well compared to what the Permian has. But still, all it's gonna help you do is mitigate your basin decline. It's not helping you stay flat. It's not helping you grow. That's the point I'm trying to make is that 
you can have these efficiencies, but the other side also has to be considered uh, as to where we are in reality. Mount Rail, you know, nothing really to report here. They haven't discovered a sweet spot in Mount Rail. That's why the well productivity is significantly below and continually declining here. And then Williams County down a lot and you know, not, not too much to share there. Continental resources, their acreage flat to declining, beaten up acreage. Um, nice productivity. There's a reason they went private because it didn't want to be controlled by the public markets telling them what to do. But to be honest with you, their rock just isn't good. Uh, so how much can they get up to? Can they get up to 225,000 again? Maybe. Uh, are they going to get any higher than that? No. So that's where we are. Cord, this is your second biggest producer in the Bakken. And look, look what's happened. They've completely given up. They just say, you know, we're, what we're drilling here just doesn't make economic sense. And production is down, uh, call it 40% since uh, late 2019 as a company, that's that's pretty massive. They, they might have done an asset sale in here too, but um, I don't think so, to be honest. I think this is just COVID decline that's now continuing. Uh, Cord, there's Hess. Same story. Marathon. Look at how filled up this acreage is. Like, they just left nothing for the scraps for, for other people to, to drill after the fact. Um, Marathon Well Productivity, Conoco, same story. Slauson is a growth company. You can see what's happened. They ran, they tried to run the Permian model. So they grew massively in 2021 and couldn't sell. Now look, they have no acreage left and production is already down 30% since, uh, let's say mid 2021. These zombie companies, like, I don't know how they're going to survive. What's what's going to happen? There's no M&A market for this sort of thing. And what's going to happen? Are they just going to produce it into a blowdown scenario and try and just harvest whatever cash they can? Seems to be headed that way. Devin, very similar story. As Lawson, just on a bigger scale, and they kind of couldn't get anywhere here. Uh, sorry. Uh, we have Enterplus here. Similar story. Drilling some good wells, actually. but. Uh, you know, running out of room still here, and and the production is still down significantly since where it was uh, pre-COVID. Grayson Mill um, didn't drill a single well in 2020, barely drilled in 2021. Now they're kind of starting to get back at it. Still haven't hit pre-COVID highs in production. Uh, Petro Hunt, not not much happening. Any of these private producers that really jacked up production in 2021, they were able to stabilize in 2022 and now they have no chance because they've drilled everything and it's it's going to be a secondary order impact to US oil production uh as these private companies in their zombie phase just like die out over time through declining production uh, here's uh Kraken same thing uh Oventive they tried to grow but it just fell right, right away that's what the wells in the Bakken are declining at now because it's like tier two, th three, four, five, six acreage uh, of Vintiv. We got EOG. Basically, they got nothing left. Here's your zombie company on a big scale that's showing up. You know, nothing you can do. Once you run out of rock, you run out of rock. Now you produce, your, you produce whatever's left all the way to zero. And um, here's a more extreme example of that. Um, because EOG ran out of acreage, looks like in 2017, 2017-18. Crescent Point, a little bit small producer, 12,000 barrels per day. They've got some acreage, but they're going to slowly just produce this for the next 10, 15, 20 years. No real growth plan here. Uh, nothing to be worried about. Um, so, okay. Uh, yeah, so you... you you actually can't water flood uh, unconventional shale. So it's just the reality of it. The rock is too tight to inject water from an injector well and put it into a producer well, right? Like just, just think about it um, from a rock opening standpoint, you're fracking the well to open up uh, channels within like very close to the, the, the producing well. If you wanted to create channels all the way from an injector to producer well, 
you just can't. There's there's too much pressure downhole, uh, and then the the actual like overburdened pressure from the earth on it uh, that it's literally impossible unless somebody can can prove it out. It is going to be probably a trillion dollar idea, uh, but so far I'm I'm not concerned about it because um, physics and reservoirs and geology is just impossible in in rock that's this tight. Um, so we'll see. We'll see if something can be done, but uh, so far, not not really concerned. Um, and okay, that's the end of the Bakken. I got five or six slides on overall stuff that I want to talk about, and we'll do brief Q and A uh, and let everybody get to the rest the rest of their weekend. Uinta Basin. This is what I mentioned earlier: is that instead of drilling tier three, tier four, Permian, Eagleford, Bakken. Some companies will move to other basins. So the Uinta Basin is a relatively new uh, basin, about 40,000 barrels of production as of January 2021. Now it's at 80,000. So not huge enough to really make an impact, but it is growing. And there's four companies. That's all we got to track, which makes it easy. Oventive, Excel, Javelin, and the uh, conveniently named Uinta Wax. So uh, these four companies. I'm, I'm tracking these. These are on my track list now, what they're doing in this basin. Um, but, the, but the reality is these basins are not ones where you can grow 500,000 barrels a year or anything like that. Like you can grow 50, 80, 100, 200,000. Maybe if that, I'd say, I'd say 100,000 right now is, is the absolute max per year. Um, and that would take a heroic effort. So right now, not that concerned watching it seeing how it develops. And when the barrels get to a significant amount, we'll take it more into the models. But keep in mind, these basins are not increasing US production. They're barely making up for declines in the Bakken and the Eagleford and what is to come in the Permian. Here you go, here's your production graphs. You know, all, all four companies are doing a pretty good job here at growing production. So we'll see how they sort of end up, uh, end up here. Uh, um, yeah, I love this question. Why is Crescent Point one of the only few who are producing their bucket slowly? Because Canadian operators are for the most part smarter in the way that they capitalize these assets. They're more worried about free cash flow generation, um, especially in this cycle, but, but even in previous cycles. They're more worried about cash flow generation and making money than some of the US-based companies, which are strictly just an effort in production gr growth, that's it. That's all they care about is like, let's grow production, let's make our million dollar bonuses, you know, never mind the acreage, never mind production operations, we don't really care. And that's why the US has been so successful at what they do, because sometimes uh, they will let things slide short term in order to, to take control of what they're doing and really show the world what they can do. So not saying one is good, one is bad, but in terms of reservoir geology and production, um, some of the Canadian produce, uh, producers do produce their assets a lot more slowly um, and just within reason. And that's why I'm so, uh, like at the start of the presentation, I mentioned the Canadian natural gas producers should be careful um, in terms of how much they want to grow base in production year after year after year. They will scare away investors for good. I can tell you that as a fact. Um, I don't even invest in those companies. I don't even look at them because I don't care. I don't care how much free cash flow they're making. Their entire like model is has proven to be a bust. Um, now, of course, hundred dollar oil price and six dollar gas solves everything and makes idiots look smart. But at the same time, um, if if I am running models at those prices anyway, why would I pick lower quality companies? Um, you know, if if we're taking that that model a script price as a fact uh, in our models, um, energy consumption by source it's never gone down. It uh, even through re through re uh, recessions there is a gap, and then you end up on your existing your existing slope. There's a gap. We didn't we didn't just go here we ended up on the existing slope. COVID is gonna be the exact same. So, 
anybody who's comparing that we're at pre-COVID oil demand and all this, throw that entire model out the window. We should be right now at about 104 to 105 million barrels of demand based on how we've reacted to every single recession in the past. And this time, there is way more money in the system. There's way more money globally floating around. So we have a long ways to go. And it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out through 2023 now, which is a real year with no COVID restrictions and no massive Fed funds rate hikes that, that really impact demand, um, especially since we were in a low interest rate environment for so long um, that, that there's a new sort of balance there uh, that we have to get to. And then the S-curve of the people and the uh, degrading geology and all that. And... Uh, too much bullishness for Sunday. Um, I think the markets should be open now. So, um, but yeah, I'm digressing here. So energy consumption continues to go up in the world. And anybody who's arguing against that can can kind of show me where uh, that, that thesis is wrong. Where are we? In the commodity cycle, there's always consolidation periods that are decades long and then breakouts that are decades long. A little bit shorter, but still can be up to decades long. We had the 1960s consolidation, the 1970s breakout, the 1980s, 1990s consolidation, and the 2000s breakout. In 2000, the price of oil was 20 bucks a barrel. That was the range. Now we're in a 50 to $100 range. The next, and we're, we have consolidated in that range. Now we go to the next range after a 12 year consolidation cycle uh, is, is where we are. Um, and trader positioning, I talked about this earlier. There's there's definitely less interest in the market and it does impact the price of oil. Some of the paper market activity is due to this and it will likely to remain a little bit subdued uh, given that producers not hedging forward. The higher interest rate causes less participants in the market and the higher volatility at a higher oil price results in more value at risk. So less people get involved. Um, I've talked about this in previous macro outlooks more in detail. If you want to understand what I just said, uh, I guess more explanation on that uh, and more details. Okay, last few slides on the sector performance. January 1st to April 30th of 2022, the XLE was up 37%, tech was down 18.5%. Last year, till July 30th, year to date, energy was up 44%, tech was down 17%. Not just was the energy sector's performance in the green itself, its relative outperformance got even higher. Last year, till October 30th, year to date, energy sector was up 66%, tech was down 25%. Once again, not only was the absolute number positive between, I'm talking between these, these different timeframes I'm giving you, but the relative outperformance was positive. 2022 was a fantastic year for oil and gas investors, despite a lot of the things not going our way. And almost every single person being against our trade, uh, whether it's politics, whether it's financials, whether it's the Fed, whether it's um, other uh, countries, whether it's recession risk, Everything went against us, and we still annihilated the broad market, as well as had a phenomenal gain uh, for the year. If we now look back one year from today, energy sector is still up 49%, and tech is still down 10%. So this is not investment advice. I'm sharing my own opinion. I'm sharing things that I see, and data, and facts, uh, and a lot of opinion as well on top of that. But I think the party is just getting started. Um, 2022 was a was a bumper year, uh, gave companies chance to pay off debt and buy back some stock, get a renewed sense of confidence with investors. Uh, at the same time, um, you know the rest of the market really suffered, and energy still was able to not get caught uh, in that drawdown fully. It did to some extent, very partially, um, but but really not not really when you think about the Nasdaq and Dow and the S&P and how far down they were. So I think that's where we are. Um, and uh, you know, that's why when, when people come to me and they wanna uh, take shots, they wanna laugh at 
at why didn't you sell in June? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Um, this is not a six month trade for me. This is a trade that has been exceptionally profitable uh, for the last two and a half years. And um, I continue to be fully invested uh, accordingly. So I think I'll start uh, stop there. Really, I think that's, that's kind of all I have to share here on the macro update. Uh, as I said, I will repeat this for anybody that's looking for the actual non-shale, but including shale, um, supply, demand, inventory macro. The October 30th a session was about seven hours. I did not want to repeat that uh, because it just, although I wanted one copy of my thoughts out there on that, I don't just want to keep repeating that. So uh, that's out there for anybody that wants more information. I am also available. My phone numbers and my uh, email is right here. Anything you would like to discuss, any data you have, that's going against this, I would love to see it, please. I am on the lookout for any information that can derail uh, this thesis, any new technologies, uh, any petroleum engineers that are listening, anybody who's in the industry. If you see some new, you know, call it uh, cool technology to do with shale coming up, uh, some new wild results you, want, uh, you would like to share, I'm happy to discuss anytime. So uh, yeah, with that, I think, um, I'm not sure if this Q&A, but, but I'd really maybe keep it out uh, for now. And um, uh, we will maybe, I'll just take a few few questions if they come up and then I wanna wrap this up here by uh, four o'clock mountain uh, for sure. So uh, um, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, really appreciate everybody joining in. These can get very technical. They can get a bit repetitive at times, um, but, but you know, that's that's just what it is. This is a, $10 trillion industry. If people are just wanting to get the spark notes on it uh, in a 10 minute session, in a 40 minute session, and you wanna make proper investments, uh, you don't wanna get stopped out of the trade or be in this panic mental health phase, you need to spend the time. That's, like, that's me being blunt. You have to spend time understanding the data, understanding the macro, understanding the companies, the basins, what they do, where they are, previous cycles, you really have to spend time. And that's why I think you see in the oil and gas industry, people either have 0% investment in oil and gas, or they have like 50% plus in oil and gas, because the time it takes to understand the sector is so big that if people make the effort, they're kind of realizing the opportunity that's here right now. Um, again, this is my opinion. This is just what I, what I um, have interpreted from the data that I watch. So, uh, yeah, so appreciate everybody sticking in. Um, always fun. It's always fun, you know, sharing these things. And uh, yeah, I, I also wanted to say this at the start, but I forgot. But if anybody has any su suggestions on other things you would like to see talked about, I'm more than happy to bring them up in a future presentation the uh, rest of this year, because it's a very macro engineering focused uh, schedule that I have. For this year. Um, yeah, uh, I did get your question, Al. I, I don't really want to talk about micro cap names uh, here, but uh, but uh, yeah, lots, lots of great activity here. Uh, lots of great response by the equities, especially on Friday. I was really happy to see a uh, major number of names closing the green, some up two, three, four percent uh, on a day that oil got hammered in the paper markets. Uh, so yeah, um, there are smaller Permian ENPs that have decent tier one acreage, I believe. I have mentioned a few that I'm that I'm like tracking from a in like from a production growth standpoint. Um, but really, it's it's not the companies that have the most inventory that's going to do well. It's companies that have undeveloped inventory and they can maintain a very low level of production as the cycle goes on. Because shale wells make a lot of money at $100 oil, at $120 oil. They don't make that much money at, at, at $80 oil. And they're basically cash negative um, as far as a full cycle basis at 70, 65 to $70 oil, they start becoming negative. So any company that, that just waited and they saved a bunch of inventory, and now they're going to produce it, not overcapitalize it, but produce it slowly over many 
you know, years, kind of like the Crescent Point example in the Bakken, uh, are the ones you want to watch. But I don't track them well enough to speak to any that I'm that I like their quality of inventory per se. Uh, Tap Rock actually was was one that I was tracking about a year and a half or two years ago, and they ended up doing the wrong thing and and just producing all the wells all at once. Uh, although I think some I think some of these companies still have some DUCs that they left. So what they did is instead of maintaining a low base, they drilled all their wells and then they just frack them kind of when the time comes, which may be good. Uh, but yeah, I'd rather spend my time analyzing Canadian ENPs. I'll be I'll be completely honest. Uh, so uh, yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. No, I'm I'm happy to be on any um news channel or or anybody and, and I'll call people out I'll I'll call people out I'm not scared about um uh, you know having to maintain any relationships and whatnot I think I think the reality needs to be displayed it's been something that's hurt investment in our sector for many many years and I think it's just something we need to do for humanity if we end up in a situation where we just keep pushing you know kicking the can down the road not understanding the problem, there is going to come a time where, where people do end up dying from energy scarcity. And it would be absolutely embarrassing given that we have the power to create energy, um, not just oil, but, but through natural gas, oil, and, and for the countries that needed coal production, uh, as well as nuclear. So if we don't stand up right now for, for sort of doing the right thing and investing in these uh, future supply, uh, I think there's a serious problem, and and the way that I can back that back that statement up is that even if we invest in future supply, and I do my very best to stimulate investment in natural gas, in coal, in oil, in green energy, in nuclear plants, we still don't have enough energy, as as I see this decade playing out. So this is not investment focused. Like I I want more supply. I want companies to do more. But produce things properly, not not these huge growth phases that then result in a corresponding decline when the world is least prepared and is least equipped to deal with these things, um, given sort of where we are right now. Uh, yes, I do have a offshore session coming up, uh, which will talk about Petrobras and their uh, offshore acreage, as well as other South American uh, deep water development and kind of reserves where we are. With so many companies at critical reserve levels, can the index continue to outperform? So this is a interesting point that I've been thinking about for about a couple of months, ever since I believe it was Diamondback that got added to the NASDAQ 100. I got thinking like, you know what? These shale players are not, not the right ones to represent our industry. They should not be the ones that are getting added to different um, ETFs and uh, indices and all this, I don't think the shale players are the right, the right companies to add because they have a known lifespan of the company, whereas low decline, high reserve Canadian oil producers can actually produce for 60 years. They, they can produce for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Those are the companies that, that, that represent the true cash flow generation of what the oil industry can do. So am I gonna change anything? I don't think so, but if somebody here has any insight or input into uh, how we can make that point clear to some of these indices and ETFs, uh, I think I would be totally open to it uh, for sure. And uh, um, it's just a reality of, of where we are uh, in this. Um, yeah, I do follow offshore oil. Yeah, yeah, quite closely. Like, like not as an investor in companies, but as a source of future production. Uh, I'm tracking just about every single uh, well that's being drilled, whether it's it's Eastern Canada, whether it's the North Sea, whether it's offshore South America, the new areas of Namibia and South Africa. Uh, the Guyana stuff obviously is is a big one. Um, Suriname as well is a very interesting area where development may actually not go ahead. Uh, compared to what was initially planned. So I'm kind of tracking everything I can, uh, onshore and offshore for that matter. So I'm not an expert in any specific one thing, but uh, I like to keep track of stuff that can 
that can cause a problem in this oil thesis way, way before the market uh, realizes these things. Um, yeah. The only reason I don't cover offshore ENPs in my in my price targets is because I, I need a general conviction that I'm offering a specific insight into the company by knowing their basin or their well results or their acreage or their management quality, whatever. And I don't have that with non-Canadian companies. I'm especially not sure of the rock. Like I need to be convinced of the geology based on decades of production history uh, or at least repeatable production. And I don't have any really good source of that uh, outside Canada at this point. Uh, can we invest in Canadian stocks from India? I really don't know the answer to that. Um, if somebody else does, if you can just um, post in the chat, uh, I would appreciate that. Yeah, natural gas is interesting. Can it go to a dollar or below? I don't think so. Um, just given where the cost of supply is. Uh, but I do think if gas stays below $3 or, or below $250, let's say, for a significant time, I think those rigs are going to get moved to the U.S. oil acreage uh, pretty much permanently. So it's going to have a lasting impact on the way we're modeling both of those going forward, more so gas, but even the oil. If you add 30 rigs, it can make a difference. Um, not that it's going to add a million barrels per day all of a sudden, but but enough that you got to redo the models a little bit. Uh, Yeah, I'm not sure what it's saying, but uh, yeah, I'm in Phoenix right now. So I've got this little temporary setup and, and I'm glad everything really worked out uh, right now so far. Um, yeah, the Permian operators want to drill deeper and they want to pay more money and try and delineate some of these acreages, you know, be my guest. I just know economically these things don't, don't really work. Um, can they work like as a commercial success? Yeah, but as an economic uh, really exercise in like repeatable uh, resource development, I don't think it's work, uh, it works. It's the same reason you don't see uh, people going and, and spending bil you know, billions of dollars trying to delineate the DJ Basin, for example, uh, or the Powder River Basin. It's because we know there's oil there. It's just not economic in a sub $100 oil environment. So, hey, maybe something will come out of this that I will learn in the next little bit. Uh, but so far, not really seeing anything to con uh, to be concerned about. Even the refracts, I'm not really all that uh, concerned about right now. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll talk about Petrobras in the offshore session. I don't have enough information right now to really make any sort of conclusive comments. Um, but their annual report shows every single FPSO that's coming online, what it cost, how much work they've done on it, and every information that an investor could want. Uh, so I am going to be looking into that um, shortly, not not as an investment, but but just for my own offshore oil model, uh, production supply model. Um, yeah, so that answers your question. Like like I follow it for my overall macro oil supply demand. I don't really care about investing in in any of these companies because I have I have five diamonds in my hand. Uh, within the Canadian space, why would I go exploring for gold and silver somewhere else, right? It doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, I did sell Royal Helium. Yeah, I did, it did exit my portfolio. It just wasn't a core position and I see better opportunities even if I uh, had to sell at prices that were maybe below what I think that play is uh, is worth. So, um, oh, I see what you mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Coronado view is from my balcony. So maybe one of these days I'll do uh, I'll do a presentation from from outside and and we'd have a nice little view uh, on the back for sure, ra rather than a walls and and curtains. Uh, yeah. Um, no real view on Aventive. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, no real view on Aventive. Uh, to be honest. Um, Yeah, I don't like I don't like these gas producing companies. And and the big view on Aventive was that uh, we would uh, call it um, when the hedges rolled off at the end of 2022, it would make a good play. And in the meantime, natural gas crashed. So they they could not have done this any worse 
than what they did. They lost the entire 2022 of natural gas pricing. Uh, and then this happens, like, you got to feel bad. Sometimes, sometimes the world is just not fair. And uh, that's, that's kind of where I am um, on that. So yeah, so I'll kind of leave it there. Uh, we're about four hours into it. So I, I once again, I really appreciate everybody's time that comes in, uh, especially with the new year here. We're, we're moving away from valuation sessions and more into the, I call it the engineering topics and macro stuff. Uh, so, you know, I think it, I think it's a good, good, good little switch now as the cycle continues on and also talk about companies and junior companies and other ones as time, co as time goes on. So, um, yeah, uh, really appreciate everybody's time. Thanks for joining us here. Uh, next week is our, uh, investment review session. So I'll be talking about every single trade that I made in 2022 and, you know, what went right, what went wrong. How am I reallocating myself uh, for this year? And uh, sort of what are the main factors to watch? You know, not everybody has time to track 40 different things every single day. So, so the main factors you watch uh, uh, to watch for this cycle. And uh, yeah, it should be a nice little presentation. And, and then uh, I think I'd love to hear other people's uh, cool trades and whatnot too. So, uh, you know, maybe we can have a space on it uh, after the fact and, and do that. So, Happy Sunday. Hope everybody has a great rest of the weekend and uh, we will catch you uh, next week or on one of the Twitter spaces.